All right. We're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, can we start with a roll call, please? Council members Bertrand. Here. Brooks. Here. Story. Here. And Mayor Peterson. Here. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice Mayor Brooks, you want to start us out? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Tonight's meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first broadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website at cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. Thank you for being here. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting, and if you come for public comment, please feel free to sign your name on the sheet at the podium to confirm that we are spelling it correctly in the record. All right, we're gonna move on. The first uh, item tonight, we have a couple presentations, and we're gonna start with a proclamation honoring Tony Castro upon her retirement. Wow. Hi, Tony. Hello. We are so excited to honor you this evening, although sad to see you go in your retirement, but you have done so much for our community, and I'd like to read a little bit of the proclamation we have for you. Whereas Capitola resident Tony Castro has served as the chief executive officer of the Capitola SoCal Chamber of Commerce for more than three decades and will retire on March 1st, 2020, and whereas she spent two years as president of the chamber prior to her 32 year run as CEO, thereby serving the organization and community for much of her adult life. And whereas oh, chamber, <laughs> all, all, I'm sorry. correction, We're, we'll correct that. And whereas chamber membership has doubled under her leadership in part due to the 2006 addition of Soquel to the group's jurisdiction, and whereas Ms. Castro has helped the chamber grow the popular art and wine festival to an event with at least 160 artists, 22 wineries, 15 entertainers, and more than 300 volunteers. Proceeds from the event help support local schools. And whereas she has been instrumental in the creation of numerous chamber events, including the Capitola Village Easter egg hunt and Halloween parade, the Soquel Village Sip and Stroll and Surf and Santa, and Whereas, she spearheaded a disaster fund to help displaced residents of the former Pacific Cove mobile home park when a storm drain pipe running under the park burst, flooding homes, and also aided impacted Capitola Village merchants. And now, therefore, I, Kristen Peterson, mayor of the city of Capitola, and on behalf of the city council, city staff, and the greater Capitola community, do hereby commend and thank you, Tony Castro, for your many years of service to Capitola. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for the proclamation, City Council and City staff and everyone. Um, it doesn't seem like it's been 32 years, but I guess it has. Time flies by quickly. Um, I've had lots of experiences over the 32 years. I've met a lot of people. I made some really close friends. And um, as a Capitola resident, I feel very fortunate to be able to retire here. And so you'll see me around. I'm not gonna disappear. Um, and I'll be working with the chamber, too. Um, but it's been a real positive experience for me, and I loved working with all the community groups. Uh, Capitola is a very special place, and um, I'm just so blessed to be able to live and work here. And so I thank you for this honor, and um, again, Capitola is a wonderful community, and my replacement is Carrie Arnone, 
and she will do an excellent job. She's about 10 years younger, has a lot more energy and new ideas, and um, she'll do really well in this position. So once again, thank you, and thank you for all of you who are here tonight, too. I appreciate the support, and um, thanks again. <laughs> We are going to move to the next item in presentations, which is the 2019 Officer of the Year presentation of the Herb Ross Award. Good evening, Mayor Peterson, members of the council, uh, staff and public. I'm honored to be here tonight. Uh, to uh, announce, recognize, and honor one of our individuals on the Capitola Police Department who's been selected as the 2019 Officer of the Year uh, and the recipient of the Herb Ross Community Achievement Award. Um, as you know, several members are nominated for this award uh, each year, and one individual is selected based upon their performance, uh, their commitment to the city and the police department, and especially their commitment to the community. And so I'm honored and I'm really happy tonight to announce that our 2019 recipient of the Officer of the Year Herb Ross Community Achievement Award is Parking Enforcement Officer Oscar Valdez. And I'd like to invite Oscar uh, up here with me at the podium as I talk about a few more things about this award and his recognition. Come on up, Oscar. And we can applaud now. <laughs> Worth mentioning and reminding many um, th this award, uh, Officer of the Year Award, uh, is an honor this year of Oscar for 2019, but also in honor of uh, Herb Ross, one of our uh, Capitola PD uh, officers who committed himself for just under 30 years to the police department from 1973 until his retirement in 2001, retiring as a sergeant. Shortly after his passing away in 2007, the community and the police department came together and they decided to rename our Officer of the Year Award to the Herb Ross Community Achievement Award. For all of his, Herb's contributions to the police department, the city, and especially his uh, contributions to the community, his involvement with the community, and truly uh, um, his desire and his application of community policing principles for many, many years, for his entire career, in fact. And so I wanna make sure that I mention that. And then also, I want to mention, as many know, that our own mayor, Kristen Peterson, is the granddaughter of Herb Ross. And so, Mayor Peterson, I know that tonight is especially, um, or extra special for you to witness uh, the presentation of this award to Oscar Valdez. And that's worth mentioning your, uh, your family and you, you being the granddaughter of Herb Ross. And so let me talk about Oscar himself for just a couple of minutes. Oscar began his career with the Capitola PD in 1987. And throughout his 30, 32 year career, he's demonstrated his commitment to the city the police department and the residents of Capitola. His expertise related to parking management and the safe movement of vehicles and pedestrians has been instrumental to our success as a city and a police department uh, in effectively uh, managing the vehicles, pedestrians, and that parking enforcement program. And importantly, the safety that Oscar and others have introduced to everybody who visits our beautiful village on a day, uh, and Esplanade on a daily basis. Uh, in addition to Oscar's commitment to his role as a parking enforcement officer for 32 years, uh, he devotes much of his off-duty time to community programs such as Special Olympics, the law enforcement tor uh, torch run, to name a few. And then really important and unique, earlier this year, uh, Oscar, in partnership with the Santa Cruz Department of Rehabilitation, provided a life-changing opportunity to an individual who desired to learn more about Oscar's role with the police department and his role in the community in an effort to overcome this individual's own challenges related to his disability. Through a modified ride-along program, Oscar was able to share positive experiences in mentoring, coaching to a deserving individual to assess that, assist that gentleman and the Department of Rehabilitation with the formation of needed programs for an underserved population here in the county. And so that, in addition to many other skills, 
uh, and examples of commitment that Oscar has provided to us throughout his 32-year 30 year career. Please join me in recognizing and congratulation, congratulating Oscar Valdez as our 2019 Officer of the Year awardee. Congratulations, Oscar. I'd also... And I would, I would also like to, uh, to mention that just behind Oscar here is his daughter and his beautiful granddaughter who are here tonight to, uh, to honor uh, their family member and join in the celebration. And we welcome both of you. Congratulations, Oscar. Thank would you me. like to say a few things? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank any, everybody who had any part in the uh, decision making of this recognition. I am honored to have been selected to receive the Herb Ross Award. Thank you. Don't, don't leave it without the presentation of the actual award, Oscar. <laughs> and then I'll invite Oscar's family. Um, Mayor Peterson, if you could join us down here, we'll take a picture uh, of Oscar with the, with the audience behind us to make it a little bit easier, but I think that'd be a wonderful picture for the family. Linda, do you want to do that, or Andy was going to? Yep. Well, both of them. Okay, we are going to uh, move on now to a recognition of our local government academy participants. Uh, in January and February, 11 Capitola residents and business representatives attended the Capitola Local Government Academy, which is a series of informational presentations and discussions on the city's government, administration, programs, and partnerships with local agencies. So we would like to invite uh, the participants who completed up to the stage here. Uh, those that we know to be in the audience, Carrie Arnone, Elizabeth Conlin, Katie Yurtberg, did I say that right? If not, you can correct me when you get up here. Uh, Gary Jensen and Brian Kirk, did I miss anybody else? If I missed you, come on up and you can tell me your name when you get here. All right. Jerry? No, Carrie. Carrie. Oh, My apologies. <laughs> Carrie, hi. <laughs> Carrie Arnone. Elizabeth Conlin. Hi. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Katie? Jertberg. My apologies. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Jerry Jensen? Thank you. Who are we missing? Oh, no problem. It and happened. she's at a committee meeting already using her. Oh, she's goodness. That's program. well. Okay. Brian Kirk. Yep. Wonderful. Here you go. Thank you so much, all of you, for your willingness to be engaged in the community in this way and learn more about our wonderful city. Um, I'd be happy to pass the mic down if you each want to do just a quick couple words on your experience and, and anything that you would like to say, or you can just say pass and move along, whatever you prefer. Um, thank you. I'm Carrie from the Capitola Soquel Chamber. It was a great experience and it's really, you know, to take advantage of learning more about how your city operates and, you know, all that the city does for our community. I encourage all of you to embrace it. And I'll add to that and just say thank you to everybody that participated in the class. It was very insightful. Highly recommended. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you for that. And it was, uh, it was really eye-opening, and any city, particularly uh, Capitola, has a really great history, and, and it was neat to hear about that. 
Yeah, I just want to echo that I appreciate everyone's time and uh, answering all my questions. Uh, and, yeah, it was a great um, experience to go through. And I also appreciate how the city um, interacted with some other uh, local agencies to bring that um, knowledge into the whole leadership uh, process. It was great. Thank you so much again. Congratulations, and I'm sure we're going to see you uh, out in the community doing great things, maybe up here on the dais with us at some point. Um, let's give a round of applause for those who have completed the academy. Congratulations. Oh, picture. Social media. <laughs> Okay, we are now at item three on our ad uh, agenda. Any additional materials? There are additional materials on item 8E regarding the carousel. Great, thank you. Uh, any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Great, thank you. Uh, now is the time for public comment. Uh, oral communications allows time for members of the public to address the City Council on any item not on tonight's agenda. You will have three minutes to speak. Uh, please feel free to come forward to the podium if you'd like to speak to the Council. Seeing none, we will move on to City Council and staff comments. Does staff have any comments? I have a few brief comments I just want to make. I know that there's been a lot of um, concern and a lot of press about the coronavirus. I want to assure everybody that the City of Capitola is been, has been engaged with the county. Um, county Health Services Agency is obviously the lead for any public health response in this county. We've been in communication with them and have been talking about getting uh, establishing sort of a briefing protocol as this issue and situation develops moving forward. In addition, on our website, we have been posting links to health services agencies, FAQs about coronavirus and CDC information. Those are two sources of information which I would suggest people rely on in the future is the best, best place to get news about what's going on and what the best practices are. And then lastly, um, department heads and I will be meeting uh, later this week, we'll be talking later this week about what the city's operational plans might look like as the situation evolves in the future and try to develop some different uh, contingencies uh, so that we're prepared as well. Great, thank you. Uh, council comments. Comments? Comments? Okay. Comments? No? Okay. Uh, I will just say briefly that there is a letter here indicating that uh, one of the uh, our residents of Capitola was the winner of the Seroptimus International of Capitola by the Seas 2020 Live Your Dream Award. And so I would just like to acknowledge Lorena Miller and say congratulations to her. I don't believe she's here tonight, but nonetheless, I would like to um, recognize our Capitola citizen for that uh, award that she's receiving. Congratulations, Lorena. Moving on now to item seven is our consent calendar. Uh, these will be enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda, which is also at the back of the room, uh, unless any member of the public or city council member would like to pull an item for separate review. Does any member of the public like to pull an item for us for, to review separately? Seeing none, any member of the council? I do. Yes. Um, pull uh, item A, the city council for an edit. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and vote on uh, items B, through F, and then we will return to item A. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the consent calendars, items B through F. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Let's go ahead and address item A now. Sure. Um, I just noticed in the uh, item regarding, sorry, let me pull it. Item 10, doesn't have the numbers on it, regarding the grants, uh, community grant strategic plan. I was just missing the comment uh, about ensuring that we implement the application changes immediately versus throughout the one two year process. Um, that was part of the motion that I made as well as uh, looking at the question. There was a question on the application itself that there was some confusion about and whether it was being addressed in the application um, and that part was missing also. 
And that so was part was, of my motion that I had made originally. Can you clarify the second correction? Sure. I'm sorry, I didn't quite um, get that. So we wanted staff to look at whether the question uh, about if there was if if there was going to be like any detriment to if we were not to give that money any longer, if there was going to be any detriment to to the city. It was an obscure question, and we got some feedback from the audience concerned that if we took that question off the original application, um, there was just some current concerns about that. So we were going to look at that and whether it was actually being addressed in the new application that was presented. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so with that change, uh, we will now entertain a motion uh, to approve item A of the consent <coughs> calendar as uh, um, as adjusted or amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll abstain. Okay, one abstention. Uh, motion carries with uh, three approving and one abstention. Great, we're gonna move on to item eight, general government and public hearings. Uh, we will begin with uh, 8A, a mid-year budget report. Do we have a staff report? Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is, uh, again, our mid-year budget update that we do each year at this time. Um, and so I'll start off by going over a couple of the uh, financial highlights. So sales tax revenue, as you know, is our largest revenue source, and it's relatively flat. Um, we did see a decrease in actual cash receipts of 225000 but that's related to, um, if you recall, back in 2018 when the state changed their software, they fell way behind on making payments. So we actually caught up on those payments during the same kind of comparable period last year, so that was why the cash receipts dropped. But if you look at actual performance back to when we had a regular um, quarter, we're relatively flat since 2017. Um, property tax continues to grow at about 4.5% over the prior year. Our budget included a 4% increase, so we'll, I'll get into a um, slight adjustment to that in a little bit. Uh, TOT growth has leveled off and been consistent, is consistent with budget projections. Um, really the only increase we've seen in TOT over the last four or five years was related to the changing in the TOT rate from 10% to 12%. But as far as the number of visitors coming, it's, it's relatively flat. I think we've kind of peaked out there based on our room inventory. Um, cannabis retail tax is the big one for this mid-year budget. It's well below budget due to unforeseen delays for the two operators getting their stores opened when we originally thought. Um, the good news, if there's good news around that, is this is really a one-time event. It's not based on poor performance. It's just a delay in getting them up and running. Um, so when you compare this year's budget to last year's budget at the same time of the year, we're really tracking, outside of the cannabis tax, we're tracking very close with our budget projections. As far as our revenue review, you can see um, we're relatively flat up there. I think that's about a 43 or $44,000 increase in revenues when we look back at the same time to the prior period. So we've had, the cannabis tax didn't come in, but we didn't have anything from the prior year, so that's kind of a wash when looking year to year. The reduction in cash receipts related to sales tax has kind of been offset by some of the other revenues picking up the slack, so we've been able to stay relatively flat. So in summary, the, on the revenue side, um, staff's recommending increasing the revenue budget by a total of 135000 and that includes 50000 increase to property tax, 20000 in investment earnings, 15000 for police services related to special events, 30,000 in parking citation revenue, 10,000 in encroachment permits, and 10,000 in building re uh, plan checks. On the flip side, we're also recommending decreases to the revenue budget of 307,000, which include um, roughly 90% of what we had budgeted for the cannabis tax. We had originally budgeted 250. We're suggesting that, or recommending that we reduce that by 225. Um, also, a $35,000 reduction in Camp Capitola fees and 47000 to the after-school program fees for a net decrease to the overall revenue budget of 157000 On the um, expenditure side, you'll see we're about roughly 600, not quite $600,000 higher when we look back at uh, the same period last year. 
five, a little over 500,000 of that is personnel, and most of, or a little over half of that change is just related to the PERS UAL payment. So we had an increase of right around $250,000 to the UAL payment, which we have really no control over. The other piece of that is just your normal um, step increases that people get as they, as they move up and gain experience, and then uh, cost of living adjustments. Everything else on the expenditure side is tr um, relatively flat. We have a little bit of increase in contract services, and that's related to um, plan checks that we have sending out, and that we're gonna kind of wean ourselves off of that, so that one will come back in line with what we've seen in prior years. So staff on the, uh, for a summary on the expenditure side, staff's recommending increases to the expenditure budget totaling 57,000, and that's uh, $25,000 for parking, pay station, repair and maintenance, 10,000 to public works for just their general contracts, and then 22,000 to community development for um, our housing uh, program administration. And that one on the other side, we're rec recommending decreases of 72,000, so that first one is the 50,000 for the ADA compliance, which we've budgeted. We just don't have anything scheduled to happen between now and June, so we're gonna pull those resources back in. And then the community development, the <coughs> building wages, the reason we bumped up the um, housing admin program uh, con contract is because we have a vacancy, so we're just taking those salary savings and switching them over, so it's, that's just kind of a wash there. So the net decrease is only 15000 on the expenditure side. Um, and then we also, uh, on the capital improvement program, we re recently received a grant from the RTC totaling $505,264. And so staff's recommending increasing the uh, capital improvement program grant revenue by that amount, the 505-264, and then also increasing con uh, construction services for pavement management by 455-264, and engineering services for those projects by 50,000. So our recommended action is to receive the mid-year budget report and amend the fiscal year 1920 budget based on the attached budget amendment request. And I have that summarized right there, which is really hard to see. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Yes, council member Bertrand. No, on the um, <laughs> repair maintenance of the uh, metering uh, devices, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. So, um, are our meters not performing, or we just never, uh, we haven't had adequate uh, support, or you know, why are we increasing that? We've incurred more repairs than we anticipated this year. It's kind of picked up. It's been picking up steadily over time. Um, we've already gone through the budget, so we're adjusting it just to kind of give us a little bit of flexibility to do the, any repairs that we need for the rest of the year. We think we have the majority of them done, but, um, and, and the chief can speak to this if he would like, but um, I believe Sergeant Evans is looking at all of the pay stations that we have out there and kind of doing an analysis right now on how much are we spending to repair them and when does it make sense to replace them and, and kind of getting some data around that because that repair and maintenance budget continues to increase on an annual basis. Okay, um, so obviously it's offset by the uh, revenue, so to speak. Correct. Okay, so the 30,000, we have increased revenue. What was that because of? That's on the parking citations. So um, last year we were, <coughs> excuse me, we were a little bit short staffed and <coughs> revenues were down and we've kind of used that number to develop the budget for this year. We're staffed fully again and so we've kind of just bumped it back up to where it traditionally has been right around 400,000. Okay, thanks. Um, I know we have a lot of ADA requirements because the report that was just submitted uh, six months or whatever ago. So why are we waiting on acting on those? Why, why do we not have things to do? Well, we have things to do. We just don't have anything that's going to happen between now and June 30th. Okay. Yeah, with the emergency repairs that's been going on and, so, and the other CIP projects that are going, we just don't have any time that we've dedicated over there. To make them happen. So, yeah, it's not that they're not gonna happen, that's more of just a delay until. No, I thought they were gonna happen, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Yes, Council Member Story. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the revenue reductions in uh, Camp Capitola fees, 35000 47000 in after-school program fees, um, was there an unexpected, did we miss it on the budget cycle or when we were preparing the budget was on the our unexpected drop in enrollment? So on the Camp Capitola side, um, we 
typically budget right around 135 or 140 and we put 175 in there this year and it we're not going to hit 175 so really that reduction is just kind of getting us back to where to normal we normally are on the after school program and I, I know Nikki's here if she wants to speak as well we set that budget up they have a capacity I believe of 40 students so we set everything up on the revenue and the expenditure side in anticipation of having full enrollment at this point we're getting about I believe half running about half but anticipate it building up as the program continues so that one's just kind of bringing it down into what we're experiencing but when once we hit the full 40 um, students per session we'll, we'll should be back up at the yeah, level I that see. we had this year okay. thank you sure yeah all right, so now we will bring this item to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now would be the time to do so. Seeing none, we will bring it back to council for a deliberation and a vote. Um, well, I, I'm very willing to uh, move staff recommendation and maybe I've just done that. Um, but, um, but with that motion, um, I think I, I would like to add, I know that it's being recommended that we um, leave our um, you know, negative fund balance to be dealt with our general fund carry forward. And I would hope that we would continue to try to reduce the usage of the carry forward as much as possible um, throughout the balance of the year. Um, and. Um, I mean, I, and I think anticipating very difficult times next fiscal year. So, because, um, I mean, with that being the proposed approach to this year-end budget, I would hope that, yeah, we don't look, paint too much of a rosy picture on it and that we're balancing this budget now, but we're using carry forwards. So, um, we have to make sure that um, we don't um, uh, continue to do that because that's not a sustainable approach. So with that, but I will make the motion. I have made the motion. So. I'll second. Echo those comments. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? No? Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 8B. Uh, introduce an ordinance amending chapter 17.74 on accessory dwelling units and chapter 17.15 or 17.16 outside the coastal zone for an R1 zoning district. Okay, good evening, Cass Council. Thank you. Um, this evening, I'm going to briefly touch upon the state requirements for the ADUs presented in depth during your January meeting. I will elaborate on two of the standards that are likely to have a very large impact on Capitola. Then I will present the Planning Commission recommendation and new research done, to the, uh, done relative to the Planning Commission recommendation. I want to preface this by saying that the new state uh, law is extremely specific, but not very easy to comprehend. Um, we've worked very closely, Matt Orbach and myself, with our city attorney, thank you, Sam, um, and our consultant, Ben Noble, who's updated multiple ADU ordinances for other jurisdictions, and to ensure that it complies with the state law while attempting to make it user-friendly as user-friendly as possible. So I apologize for, it, it is not easy to comprehend, but we've tried, we've made our best effort to try to break it down and um, create tiers and make it more easy than the state, how the state wrote this. So there's um, very specific regulations within the state law that had to be followed. Um, on January 16th, 2020, the city staff presented the new state ADU regulations to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission requested that City Council provide general direction on the approach for the draft ordinance in terms of either matching the state law or making the recommendations more permissive than the state law. On January 23rd, we came to the City Council and the City Council provided direction to bring the code into compliance with the state regulations and not to incorporate any regulations that are more permissive than allowed by the state. Um, on February 6th, the Planning Commission reviewed and unanimously gave a positive recommendation for the adoption of the ADU ordinance. 
with modifications to the required parking within the coastal zone. We'll get into the specifics of that shortly. Um, the following two slides list the most significant changes required by the new state law. These changes are outlined in the staff report in detail and were introduced during the January meeting. I am not going to go through all of these requirements right now, um, but I will elaborate on the two standards that will have a large impact on Capitola. I will start with the guaranteed allowance and then go into the, multifam the impacts to multifamily properties. And we'll have the opportunity to come back to any of these if you have questions. Okay. Within the general requirements for all ADUs, there is a new guaranteed allowance for a property within a, with a single family dwelling or a proposed single family dwelling to also be allowed an 800 square foot ADU up to 16 feet in height with four feet side and rear yard setbacks. Maximum building coverage, floor area ratio, and private open space standards cannot prohibit the development of the ADU. The guaranteed allowance of an 800 square foot uh, floor area in addition to the maximum floor area of the property. This is very different from our old code. The previous secondary dwelling unit ordinance gave a floor area bonus for properties with an accessory dwelling unit. The new state law is very permissive and allows property owners to exceed the maximum floor area of a property of up to 800 additional square feet. Therefore, in our draft ordinance, staff is suggesting removing the bonus tied um, to bonus floor area for ADUs. In addition to removing it from the ADU chapter 17.74, staff is also proposing to remove the reference to from the bonus um, of the bonus from chapter 17.16, that's your single family residential um, outside the coastal zone, and chapter 17.15, the single family residential district within the coastal zone. This will completely eliminate the floor area ratio incentive for lots with ADUs from the zoning code. Any questions about that? Why, yes, sir. Why would we, why would staff recommend taking away the incentive? Because under the state code, there's a new incentive of going beyond the floor area ratio, the maximum floor area with an extra 800 square feet for an ADU. So it's actually built into the state code. Okay, yeah. Any other questions so far? No? All right. Okay. Next, I'm going to get into multifamily um, and the impacts from, or how they will impact Capitola, the ADUs. So within the new standards of the state law, there are four specific scenarios called out in which a city can only apply the general standards which apply to all ADUs and limited standards defined by the state. Two, of the, two are applicable to multifamily housing. If an application complies with the limited standards, the city can only apply the very limited review standards and no permit, oh, and, sorry, and the permit must be issued ministerially through a building permit over the counter. There's no required planning commission review for these next two examples. So the next two examples are multifamily. The first scenario for multifamily residential is the conversion of non-livable space. In this scenario, the existing multifamily structure may convert space that is not utilized as living space. The state provides examples of non-livable space, including storage rooms, boiler rooms, passageways, attics, basements, or garages. The property owner is allowed to convert a minimum of one ADU and up to 25% of the total residential units on the property. The conversion must comply with the state building code. That's the limited criteria. It must comply with the building code. And again, this is a building permit issuance. So, um, This is the Capitola Greens located on 42nd Avenue and Clare Street. It is a 52-unit multifamily development. Within the new state legislation, up to 25 of the existing 52 units could convert non-livable space to ADUs. 
That's 13 new ADUs on the site. It appears from the view off 42nd Avenue that some of the units have carports. Carports are considered, considered non-livable space that may be converted. In this example, the non-livable space within the carports have been converted to residential units. There is no requirement to replace the displaced parking on site. The permit would be approved ministerially over the counter through a building permit. We do not require that the H uh, we do require that the HOA approve any conversions within multifamily developments that are subject to an HOA. So we would need a letter from the HOA stating that the HOA is in support of an application such as this. That means that the owners would have a vote and would likely, hopefully, want to mitigate some of the impacts for parking and design that could be proposed within one of these projects. If I have a look of concern on my face, I think it's one that's shared by many community development directors throughout the state of California that have multifamily residential within their city limits. As much as we need housing, it also, uh, for me to send out a Friday update that we're getting a 25% increase in density on a property would be a challenge and to approve that ministerially over the counter would, is a big change for the city of Capitola. So I wanted to make sure you all <laughs> are very aware of these changes. So. Um, Can we pause for questions between each item or should we wait sure, until Sure, any end? questions on that one? Yeah. Um, what standing does the HOA have when it's a state regulation? They, the HOA is, they own the property and they can, um, they have to have a vote in most circumstances. They're going to have to follow their agreements, but. Um, it, are you? Yeah, you go ahead. It, it's also a different, it's like comparing apples and oranges because the state regulations restrict what local agencies can do to regulate ADUs, but the HOA is a private entity. So if there's a provision in the HOA agreement that says, that speaks to ADUs or additional structures, the HOA can enforce that agreement. So the HOA could prevent this, but we couldn't. Is that my understanding? Assuming there's something in the HOA agreement that speaks to it, presumably. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a, another mechanism that the HOA has, presumably. They are not restricted in the same ways that we, that we are. So the but answer. Our, but our, they also don't have as much authority as we do. So. And, and our requirement to requ that the HOA write a letter in support and um, means that they're going to have to have a majority support or whatever is outlined in their agreements um, so that a single condo owner couldn't come in. If we didn't have that listed and a single condo ca owner came in and said, I want to convert my garage, we can say, well, you need to go back and get your letter of support from your HOA. So, so that says to me if there's an association of some sort in the particular spot where people live, that trumps state law. That's what I'm having a problem understanding. If that's the case, fine. I, I just having a problem logically understanding it. My suggestion would be to think about it like this: the state law is on the city and what the city has to allow, but but it doesn't um, compel property owners to take certain actions. So, in other words, the HOA, which owns property that would be affected by this change, would still have to want to do it. Okay, so because there's multiple owners, they all have to agree, or 51, 50 plus 1 percent, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Subject to their CC and Yeah, subject to the rules. Okay, but got yes. it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. Yes, Council Member Story. Um, concerning the conversion of boiler rooms, uh, alleys, um, or hallways, uh, storage areas, and closets, um, are the, and well, are there minimum standards that uh, define those as habitable areas? Um, are there minimum square footage requirements for ADUs? Um, and um, and if those um, if those um, places were essential in order to have the um, project um, in compliance with their, if they had a conditional use permit, could they still uh, eliminate it as they can with the parking? So um, 
The requirement is that it must comply with the building code. Um, you asked about minimum sizes. There's minimum sizes within our health and safety code of 150 square feet for an ADU. The building code references 220 square feet, which is what our building official feels more comfortable for health and for mm -hmm. safety reasons. Um, and then the dis would parking be required for these converted areas? So any, any converted area needs to meet um, the building code, which should address health and safety. So right. No, I wasn't. I, I understood that. Okay. Yeah, that they could eliminate the parking and uh, and it couldn't. We couldn't require that as a condition. But these other areas that we were t talking about being converted, if those were necessary in order to have the project be in compliance with their conditional use permit. In other words, if they're required to have a boiler and it has to be of a certain size and that had been imposed. Is that now they can ignore that and go ahead and eliminate the boiler and put in an ADU? That is a good question. I, I'd want to think a little bit more about it. I, okay. I would bet that the condition would trump. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll see if we I, get a I test could, case. I, I could very well be wrong about that. My <laughs> guess is the legislation has not contemplated that. Right. Okay. Thank you. So what control do we have if some of those areas are for garbage, refuge, things like that? Um, we've set aside areas where bicycles are permitted. I, I know that. So what happens there? Uh, garbage is a main one for neighbors. I know that, you know. The facilities where the garbage cans are, they usually should be covered, they have to be brought in from the street, that kind of stuff. So how do we deal with that? So we do have standards for um, garbage to be out of sight on non-collection days, so they would have to follow those standards. Again, if there were conditions tied to the multifamily, we would, I think we'd have to look at this further of tied to a conditional use permit. But really what this legislation is saying is that if you have the non-livable space that it has, it, we should be approving these conversions unless they don't comply with the building code. I mean, there, there's only four scenarios in which they outline the criteria, which is uh, specific to limited standards. Um. So these laws, I, I, I don't know how many revisions to your ADU ordinance you've gone through in the last couple years, but it's not uncommon for an agency to have gone through several by this point because these laws just keep coming fast and furious. Um, this year was a package, last year was a package. And so what that means is that they are not getting litigated as quickly as they are getting made. And so we don't have, we're not being obtuse. We, do, we don't know some of the answers to these questions, especially yours, Council Member Story, because it, it has just not been tested. It's not been litigated in a couple years. if the legislature will slow down and let the courts shake some of this out, we will have some better answers because some of these things are just going to have to be tested. Further questions on this particular aspect? No? Okay. Move forward. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The next, um, the second scenario under the limited review standards is for detached ADUs on multifamily parcels. Um, within this standard, there's a maximum of two detached ADUs allowed per parcel within, with an existing multifamily dwelling. The maximum height can be up to 16 feet, and there's rear and side yard setback requirements of four feet. This is a multifamily at 1910 46th Avenue, known as Chateau Capitola. In this example, there are no existing carports, um, and we will assume that there's very limited non-livable space available for a conversion. The property owner may develop a maximum of two detached ADUs as long as they comply with the maximum height limit of 16 feet, minimum rear and side yard setbacks of four feet, and are built in compliance to the building code. So, so under these two, these are the two scenarios that apply to multifamily dwellings for the future within Capitola. Um, Another question that came up is could they apply both at the same time? So could an HOA say we're going to do 25% conversions and also two ADUs? And there's um, no discussion in the 
legislation that says they could not. So our take would be that yes, you could convert up to 25% or you could have up to 25% additional units as well as two detached units. Any questions? Katie, how many, how many multifamily, how many scenarios are we talking about within the city, lim city limits? Like, I'm going to take a guess of yeah. about 25 to 30. I'm, I'm not quite, okay. there's probably more. I'd go Multi more. I'd go more, yeah. Okay. 50 or 70. Yeah, maybe 50. We have quite, we've got such a great mix of housing, and I know that half of our housing is through apartments and multifamily, so I, I bet the number's at least 50. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Will the carports at 600 Park could be converted? Uh, yes, 25 percent. Okay. Next, we will discuss three topics in which the council has some discretion on how to apply within the ordinance. You will recall from our January discussion, the city has the option to allow separate sale of ADUs to nonprofits. Um, and some abilities to allow some ability to allow ADUs to be utilized as vacation rentals. The ordinance was drafted to prohibit separate sales and vacation rentals for ADUs. This is consistent with the council direction to not make the code more lenient than the state regulations. I'll stop there for a minute. Is there any change of direction? Is that the one we would say we said we would come back in a year? Yeah, we'll re to revisit. We'll see how it's going in other jurisdictions. Just for one, not for two and three, right? Just for one, Got it. separate sale of ADUs. Okay. The third category, parking, was discussed during the January hearing. Since we last met, new information has come to light on the city's ability to require parking within the coastal zone. As you may recall, the new state law mentions the ability of local jurisdictions to require parking, but at the same time, it exempts most ADUs from parking requirements. No parking spaces can be required for internal, junior, or attached ADUs. The only type of ADU required to have parking under the new state law is a detached ADU. In addition, there are other exemptions for ADUs um, that are listed on the slide. The first one was a topic under the, that we discussed during the last meeting, which has great implications for the city of Capitola. We showed this slide during the January meeting. It shows the impact of the first exemption for ADUs for properties within one half mile walking distance of public transit. This exempts most of the city from parking requirements as shown in yellow. The area in gray is the only area with, within the city that could require parking for detached ADUs. When we last met, the City Council provided direction to require on-site parking to the extent that we can. So what has changed? Since we last met, we have learned that we can apply the standards differently within the coastal zone in an effort to protect coastal resources. The state ADU law specifies that it shall not be construed to supersede or in any way alter or lessen the effect of the application of the California Coastal Act of 1976. This gives the city the ability to maximize protection of coastal resources consistent with the city's local coastal program and the California Coastal Act. Staff has used this allowance in the draft ordinance to include specific standards within the coastal zone for parking which deviate from the parking standards in other areas of the city. Those standards are that there's one required on-site parking space um, for all ADUs within the coastal zone. Converted garages must provide replacement of parking on-site. And lastly, during the Planning Commission review, they recommended an exception to the required on-site parking within the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood, specifically tied to single-family homes. This slide shows all the properties within the coastal zone. The city council has the ability to require all ADUs within the coastal zone to have on-site parking. As you can see, the coastal zone is comprised of about two-thirds of the city, including the majority of residential neighborhoods. When we took the new information to the Planning Commission, we provided three new options for the commission to consider for the treatment of parking within the coastal zone. 
The first was to require on-site parking for all ADUs within the coastal zone. The second was to require parking within a certain distance of the coast. The third option was to require parking within specific neighborhoods in the coastal zone due to existing on-street parking issues. This option would have included neighborhoods such as the Jewel Box, North 40s, and Riverview Terrace and existing large, family, large multifamily developments due to the high demand on on-street parking. The final option was to not treat parking differently within the coastal zone. The Planning Commission discussed the options and ultimately expressed concern that the majority of the neighborhoods in the coastal zone have, extremely high, have extreme high demand for on-street parking. They weighed the impacts on coastal access if more demand is placed on, on the on-street parking and the impacts to, of, to existing front yards if ADU parking was required on the property. Ultimately, the Planning Commission recommended the parking be required in the coastal zone except within the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood. The Parking Commission, the Planning Commission explained that they wanted to preserve the neighborhood front yards from impacts of expanded parking. Cliffwood Heights is the one neighborhood they identified of having available street parking as well as on-site parking. The lots in Cliffwood Heights are much larger than the typical residential lots throughout Capitola, so there's more street frontage for the wider lots. Um, staff has since studied the neighborhood to ensure the assumptions reflected reflect the actual conditions. Staff surveyed the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood. We took random sample of 10% of the single family homes in the neighborhood and counted available parking spaces on two separate days. The samples were taken at 7 a.m. and at 6 p.m. peak hours for residential parking. The survey concluded that driveways were less than 50% occupied during the four surveys. This means that for a, a driveway with two parking space, there was typically one space or two available on the site. Staff also surveyed the availability of street parking during the four visits. The majority of the streets had more than 50% of the street parking available, shown in yellow and green on the slide. The streets that are impacted beyond 50% are those with large multifamily developments along Kennedy Drive and Balboa. So from what we have learned, there is available street and on-site on parking in the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood. I'll also mention that I've driven through many of the neighborhoods uh, um, and walk the neighborhoods of Capitola regularly and know the impacts that exist within the jewel box in the North 40s um, um, and, and feel confident that there are, th those neighborhoods are more impacted than the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood. I included, we included options within the staff report and have shown on this, that are shown on this slide. We'll come back to these options after discussing the impacts of requiring on-site parking. In considering the requirements for on-site parking, there is also aesthetic impacts to consider. Within the state law, parking for ADUs is allowed within the front, side, and rear yard setbacks. In Capitola's neighborhoods with compact lots, such as the Jewel Box and Riverview neighborhoods, new parking spaces within the front yard will be allowed and landscaping would be displaced. To mitigate the impacts of parking in the front yard, the draft ordinance requires parking spaces in the front yard for ADUs to be limited to two parallel strips of pavement, no wider than two and a half feet each, that utilize permeable paving and have landscaped areas between the strips, as shown in this example. Also of note is requiring on-site parking will mean that some residents will not be able to have an ADU. Properties with no front, side, or rear yards would not be able to provide parking and therefore could not convert interior space to an ADU within the coastal zone. Outside the coastal zone, there is an exception to parking for internal ADUs and garages that make it so parking is not required. <clears throat> I have a question, Katie. Mm -hmm. Could they have done that previously? Can, could those owners have previously built an ADU on the property? So it's not like they're losing anything 
No, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that that's clear. You know, I will, I will elaborate on that. It, when I, um, during the last review of ADU updates, we added the parking requirement of one space. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, there was not a parking requirement for ADUs. There was, um, it was based on the floor area ratio of a home. Right. And then the, we specifically added one parking space for ADUs in the last zoning code update. Can I? But, I'm Go sorry, ahead. can I just no. clarify that? For, for those of you who aren't familiar, who haven't done time on the Planning Commission, <clears throat> we allow a, historically, we've allowed a specific number of square feet per house, and that is tied to then your parking requirement. And it goes all the way up to four parking spaces, potentially, mm -hmm. for a single family home. So our old code, the way it was written, if you wanted to cut your 4,000 square foot home up into an ADU and a home, you'd still be required to do four parking spaces. So while we didn't require parking specifically for the ED, ADU, it was built into the overall um, requirement, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess my thinking is that there isn't gonna be, an, there were some neighborhoods that still would not be able to build ADUs as just like they did in the past, previously could not have, so. Yeah, so since the 2018 update, this, there's right. no change. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that even in the coastal zone, the junior ADUs, the internal ADUs are still exempt from the parking requirement? As drafted, yes. You could, I, I think because we have that flexibility within the coastal zone, if you chose to require parking for the junior ADUs, we could do that. Okay, I, I think that's what I was trying to get to with this new finding concerning uh, protecting of our coastal zone, we could require for those junior ADUs, internal ADUs, to impose the parking requirement. So I would want to go back to the law and make sure that it's subject to the same um, allowances, that, that it doesn't supersede the Coastal Act in any mm -hmm. way, but I believe okay. that could be applied. Okay, thank you. Just, just to clarify, the Coastal Act says we need to have parking, correct? Correct, so. But, but the law is not meant to supersede the Coastal Act. So doesn't that mean that anything we do, we still have to have parking? Because the Coastal Act says so? So I think um, when there's multiple laws that are in conflict, the we have the ability to draft this to say that no parking is required in the coastal zone. However, um, we may get, so when we submit this to the Coastal Commission uh, for feedback, at this point, there, um, the city of Santa Cruz submitted their LCP today, so they haven't received uh, feedback on theirs yet. Um, I did speak with somebody uh, that works in the coastal for a coastal commission and at this point they haven't put out guidance specifically towards how they're going to treat parking um, of ADUs within the coastal zone but I, but I think there'll be a practical approach hopefully um, the county is taking the approach that in their overburdened areas such as Pleasure Point neighborhood they are requiring the on-site parking as we would be doing here, but in other areas that are not overburdened by parking, they're not requiring the on-site parking, they're following. So they're, they're um, divvying it up by what, our, what the existing conditions are. Um, but in those, and the city of Santa Cruz is not requiring parking within the coastal zone. So, and it's really a matter of when you're looking at the housing law and then the, um, the Coastal Act and your LCP of how we weigh those and give priority. So that's really, um, it, and attached to the staff report were the references to parking within our LCP and within the Coastal Act, and hopefully those help guide the conversation. But again, it's really a prioritization and understanding of what, Im what impacts exist within our city. So yeah, may I follow up to that real quick? So then why is it bringing, being, why is it being brought back to us today if there hasn't been any final findings, if we haven't really seen what other coastal communities, how they've, they've been impacted on, on this? Why would we have to vote today or make a decision on, on now adjusting what we previously agreed upon? 
Sure. So following uh, the January meeting, I actually met with a couple of other uh, community development directors in the vicinity. And when I learned about how the county is approaching this with setting different standards for different neighborhoods to, uh, due to the proximity to the coast and the impact of people, par like Pleasure Point is a great example of people looking for on-street parking to go surfing on 38th Avenue, right? So in, in throughout that neighborhood. So um, treating different neighborhoods uh, based on the prior, you know, the priority of coastal access. Um, so we have that, uh, so after um, learning that we can apply this differently based on the coastal zone, mm -hmm. I thought it would be appropriate after giving, being given direction from the city council to make our standards, um, you know, as strict as the state will allow at this point since the state has gone so permissive. And so once I learned that we can treat parking differently within um, the coastal zone and knowing what a challenge parking is within the city of Capitol, I thought it would be appropriate to bring it back. Um, you will see as option number four is to not include separate standards within the coastal zone, and that's <coughs> also appropriate at this time. Mm -hmm. If the council um, is, doesn't think that um, parking for coastal access should be on a uh, more highly weighted than affordable housing, Right. I guess, I guess my concern is, is how do we know that the state, with all the future litigations that will probably occur from this, how do we know that the state wouldn't come back and say, you've made this re too restrictive, that wasn't the intent of, our, of this passing of this new law, now you're in trouble. So I okay, guess that's so my, con my concern. Um, within 60 within 60 days of council adoption this needs to be submitted to the state and they'll give us their feedback i've actually sent off a draft of our code they have not given feedback as of yet but um, once we have an adopted ordinance we'll submit the adopted version and we may we may be coming back to you to say just that they think we're being too restrictive by placing it within the whole entire coastal zone and we'll have to relook at the standards and see what their recommendation is. Did I hear you correctly? You, you've submitted something already to the state that included our previous decision? Is that what you just said? Um, so more recently and just talking with them about the process, mm -hmm. they said you can go ahead and um, submit and we'll try to get you comments based on what you have so far to give you expectations to set some expectations, and they haven't given back any comments at this point. And what did so. you submit exactly? What was submitted to? Just the ordinance that's before you this evening. So oh, so you actually did submit this language to to them already? Just for general feedback to start the conversation. Yeah, yeah I mean, I feel like that's yeah. a bit short. You know, like, why wouldn't we wait to see what their feedback? Well, the legislation says that it has to be submitted. It, it, it seems to indicate that it's supposed to be submitted after it's passed. And so Katie was actually um, super diligent and f because other jurisdictions are submitting after they've passed the ordinance and doing exactly what Katie said and what we may have to do here, which is come back after they've gotten feedback back from the state. But Katie actually kind of took the initiative and found out that they would perhaps be available to give us comment before we brought it to you. Um, so we're trying it to see how that goes. I will say, you know, these changes to the state law became effective January 1, 2020. And so all agencies are doing what Capitola is doing right now, or they have all, all agencies in the state, they are doing what Capitola is doing, or they have already done it, which is to update their ordinance to be consistent with state law. Because state law is so permissive, there are provisions of your ordinance, like every ordinance, that were consistent with state law before, but are no longer. So to con we have no idea how long it'll take the state to get back to us with feedback. So I think it's advisable to go ahead now with this ordinance, some ver an ordinance, whatever you guys want it to look like. And if we end up having to change it, we'll just have to do that rather than wait for the state feedback. It's arduous, but again, this is a new process. Yeah, I mean, I guess my biggest concern is that we may or may not have found a loophole to the state the new state law and that's that's my concern you know and i don't so, think we find found the loophole and if we are i would bet a lot of other agencies i guess what i'm saying is this well. new coastal act the this new this being more permissive now 
is somewhat of a loophole now that to make to trumping the new state law. And so the question, kind of what Mayor Peterson was saying was, which one should we follow? And the response was, we have to just choose one. And that's a d interesting position to be in. And so what I'm hearing um, Katie say is that she's sent information to get more feedback on that. And that's, I would be interested in knowing what that feedback was before yeah. making a decision. Oh, okay. I, so I I don't, I'll, I'll back up that when I, I spoke to the state the end of last week, and in speaking to their staff there, they said, oh, we're, well, we're happy to review your ordinance at any point. And just the, the requirement is that it come in within 60 days, after 60 days of adoption. But they've been working so closely with jurisdictions on questions, and as questions come up, we'll reach out and talk to them. So um, I think, you know, I feel confident that the the parking requirement within the coastal zone, I know it's being applied within the county's new regulation. So it's not, I don't think it's anything new to them of, of what they're seeing submitted by different cities, but um, it was really, I was hoping to get some comments back before this hearing that I could share. But, okay. but we will be, based on the direction that's provided tonight, they're clear that we didn't have, it was in a draft format and we'll be moving forward with adoption. I, I also, I, I don't know by what mechanism the state would take any sort of punitive action against the city for making yeah. whatever the wrong interpretation is, particularly when no one is quite sure what the wrong interpretation, well, that's not true. We know there are multiple wrong interpretations, but in mm -hmm. this particular question that we're trying to answer here, there doesn't seem to be, there seem to be, um, doesn't seem to be an exact correct interpretation. We're pretty confident, confident in the legal interpretation that we've made, but I just don't know how the state would build a case to come after the city. I don't even know by what mechanism they would do that. It seems like the more likely approach would be, like Katie said, they would tell us in response to the draft that we've submitted that this won't work and ask us to change it. So I'm going to just move on to the next slide that would that gives a little more detail on what the next step is with the HCD. So within the HCD, once we submit our official draft, um, the HCD has to submit written findings for compliance. If they don't find that our ordinance is in compliance, they will inform us and we can amend the ordinance. The alternative to that is to adopt the ordinance um, without the changes including but we would have to rely on the state law so that that's the outcome of that i just have a question so you've been in um consult with other city planners and the idea came up and you're applying it here or taking advantage of the idea of having different scenarios like where there's high density or low density in terms of parking. So in the past has the Coastal Commission, um, when there's a lot of cities going in that direction trying to come up with a certain way to um, interpret the city, uh, excuse me, the Coastal Commission's rules and regulations, if there's a lot of coastal communities that do that, does that hold weight, or do they look at each individual city differently? The fact that we're sort of following the same example, Santa Cruz and maybe Santa Barbara, does that hold weight with them? We're trying to apply something that's m meaningful to our community as opposed to you know, a state overall regulation that may not be as um, particular to a community's needs. So they'll apply, they'll um, look at your adopted LCP and see how what you've proposed complies with your LCP. So they do recognize each city as a separate entity and how we're going to draft our ordinance based on our unique circumstances. And the LCP goes into great detail about preserving Capitola's neighborhoods and access to the coast. So in that respect, um, the I, I think the Coastal Commission will most likely support our, if we were to, um, require parking within the coastal zone areas. Mm -hmm. it, it just may be the state that, I, I don't know how closely they look at the specifics when at the state level of Capitola's different neighborhoods, mm -hmm. but if we have um, 
findings about specific neighborhoods that are impacted by parking because of our proximity to the coast, I think it makes a strong argument, especially where it, it's um, identified within the law that it in no way decreases our ability to apply our LCP locally. And the also the law. fact in your attachment, if I may say, I mean, you did some work to see how it affects certain neighborhoods, so I think that supports our argument. Yeah, which was good. Questions? No, that's it. Questions? No. Continue? Or is that the end? Um, well, there's more slides, but this is the, the big um, item that I would like direction on, is how we'd like to apply the parking standards. Um, first, I'll go to number four, is we really don't need to create separate standards within the coastal zone if that were the desire of the city council. Um, the first option is to adopt the ordinance and require parking for all properties within the coastal zone. That's how it was originally drafted for the Planning Commission's review. The second is to adopt an ordinance as drafted with an exception for single family lots in the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood that reflects the Planning Commission recommendation. Third is to modify the draft ordinance to limit the exception to lots in the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood with existing single family homes, excluding properties along Kennedy Drive and Balboa Avenue as shown in attachment nine. And then lastly, the option to just treat, not treat the coastal zone any differently in regards to parking. And of course, if you have the ability to go with any of these recommendations or create a hybrid approach of something you think really meets the intent of the local coastal plan as well as the housing laws. Councilmember Patron had a question, and then we'll come to Councilmember Story. So I have a question that Yvette might have some a uh, little more experience with, but you're not including um, capital nulls in this in terms of the Cliffwood Height exemption. No. Okay. So you noted in your evaluation of parking density that along Kennedy, um, there's just no parking, especially after work, mm -hmm. and that is because of the overflow, I believe from uh, Capitol Hill's. I mean, they need parking. There's so much demand, and that's why on Kennedy Avenue, when I go there after work, I mean, it's completely covered with cars. So your um, survey adequately, to me, points out a problem with not including Capitol Hill's. Thank you, Mayor. Just it's a matter of clarification about the Planning Commission's recommendation concerning uh, Cliffwood Heights and um, what's the real difference between option two and option three? Um, um, they both, both refer to single family lots? Yes, they both refer to single family lots within option three, the single family lots that are located directly across from the multifamily um, developments on both Balboa Avenue and Kennedy Drive would not uh, be granted the exception because those streets are heavily impacted by on-street parking. So the area is shown in red, um, and I can also, in the packet there was a separate map, but so the, along Balboa Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So that would prohibit the single family residents that are across the street from multifamily residents from being. They would, they would be required to have on site parking. I, yes. Um, and why wouldn't the, um, just applying the coastal zone, if we were to go in that direction, um, requirement of that there be parking um, cover that? situation on Park Avenue and Kennedy or or how far in is the coastal zone at that location um, it in to the freeway yeah to the so freeway to but the freeway it the, the whole neighborhood is within the coastal zone to the freeway yeah. the um, Oh, all, all of Cliffwood Heights is, in the, Cliffwood is Heights. within that zone, okay. So um, you also asked um, if 
If you were to adopt the ordinance and require parking for all properties within the coastal zone, how would that impact those properties on that street? Mm -hmm. um, on that street, they would, um, they would be required to have on-site parking. So there would be the, the new strips within the front yard probably to provide the parking if they didn't have, there, there's a maximum requirement of four on-site parking spaces. So if they have the four on-site parking spaces, they'd be in compliance. Mm, okay. um, if they were to convert the garage, that's another story. They'd have to create two more, most likely two more on-site parking spaces to make up for the two spaces that are in the garage. So m most likely you would see a four, parking for four cars in the front yard right. when a garage is converted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. River Trend. So yeah, I, I guess I am getting a little confused. And my earlier comments were, um, I, I don't want to exclude the possibility for houses, uh, single family homes on Kennedy across from Capitol Knowles of having the right or the ability to have ADUs. Um, I just, I, I note that the parking, like you, you found out, from my perspective, is because there's so many cars at Cliffwood Heights, I mean, at Capitola Knowles. So my concern was I, I don't want them to not lose that right. They, they won't lose the right. They'll just have to provide the parking on site. So okay. they'll, that, they'll have, have to no add more driveway parking okay. if so, necessary. So if they have the right and they provide parking on their site, it's almost status quo. And, and you feel status quo should prohibit the other houses on Kennedy across from Capitola Knowles from having the right to do ADUs? So they would have the right to do ADUs. They would just have to, because the, um, basically, I should, I should take a step back on the Planning Commission recommendation. They recommended this to preserve the front yards within Cliffwood Heights. They felt that there was enough street parking available and driveway parking available, that this is the one neighborhood where they could protect protect the front yards from being converted to driveway areas. Mm -hmm. But any area um, that would not have this exemption would still have the right to ADU, an ADU on the property. They just have to provide the parking within the property. Mm -hmm. So there may be an, there will most likely be an impact to front yards on those properties that don't qualify for the exemption. So, uh, yeah. And realistically speaking, how many ADU applications have we seen in the last three to five years? So we have not received that many. Less, um, I think last year it was about six. Right. And, and that's under the new regulations. Right. And so I will say, though, since the update to the state laws this year and mm -hmm. people realizing before we had standards for minimum lot size, there were many people that couldn't have an ADU and right. um, we've ha we have an inquiry on an ADUs daily so and since this update has passed we've had one that came in really fast an, an amendment to a previous application to um, allow them to take advantage of the state code should we require parking in the yeah. Depot Hill area so we're, we're we're having a lot more activity at the front counter I anticipate an increase in applications but sure. and I mean on the average it costs about $100,000 starting to build an ADU, right? I mean, I'm just thinking the intent of the state law was to create more housing. Mm -hmm. And where we have an opportunity to, to do so, and where, for me, I'm thinking about the regulations, and now we found, you know, we had this additional or previous agreement to just say, okay, we're going to follow the state law. Now we found that there's an opportunity here to make it more prohibited because we'll, we can require parking again. So it just, it takes away those opportunities for many families who need to build these ADUs with, for their families, for their kids to come back, for their, for their parent or whatever. And I, so it, it's just an interesting position to be in when you, there, there's a definite, there's a definite intent. So my question is, what are some of the areas that would not be, could, what are some of the areas that could benefit from this, like wouldn't have the most impact? So are you just saying the Cliffwood Heights area 
would be the least impacted because we know Riverview and the other smaller areas, they actually couldn't build an ADU on some of those more heavily trafficked areas and who we see a lot of parking issues over there in that area. I'm just trying to think of those concerns from, from what I've heard from other people. So um, I think there's like portions of Depot Hill, um, not right along the bluff or along the cliff there, but as you get further back into the neighborhood, I don't think um, they're as impacted by parking except for certain times of the year, um, weekends during the summer. Yeah. Being, but there, there are some, and part of that is the second home ownership there and the fact that nobody's home a lot of the time. And so, um, but as you mentioned, about 50% or if there's about 50 multifamily units, apartment units, different types mm -hmm. that, you know, w those, if we, if we changed it to requiring, a, requiring parking, each and every single one of those built would require parking, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the state law, which is to create more housing, op housing stock in the communities, correct? I think it definitely depends on the specifics of the location. So, some of the multifamilies have a lot of open space and could provide extra parking on the sites, but um, it would just take more of an investment and it would be more expensive yeah. if, if that area is available on the site. But yes, it, it does make a, another challenge. Mm -hmm. Correct. Any other questions? Um, procedurally, if you're looking for feedback on this particular aspect of this item, I'm assuming we need to go to public comment before we can give any any comments and and deliberation. You, you can do the whole thing at once. You you don't need to go to public comment. And are are you asking if you need to go? I'm saying if we're giving feedback just on the parking aspect of this and giving direction to council on how to move forward with just the parking aspect of this, and then we're gonna move on to another aspect, then shouldn't we get public comment on the parking aspect of this? You don't need to. You can do the entire thing, get public comment on the entire thing, and then come back and give direction. Okay, then let's the not give thing. direction on, on this okay. part yet. Let's okay. finish and the uh, I'm just about to wrap then, okay. it up. So the Okay, so under next steps, um, after we have city council adoption, um, then the amended ordinance must be sent to the California Department of Housing and Community Development, the HCD, within 60 days. And as I previously stated, they can either send us written findings for compliance with the state regs, or they may send us um, what needs to be amended in the ordinance and at that point we'd be coming back to you and talking about amending the ordinance and during the meantime the state law would still apply to our within the city of Capitola following that we would move forward for coastal commission certification may, may I ask about um, the second option if under if HCD finds local ordinance is inconsistent oh we can we can just adopt the ordinance as it is um, and make our own findings of why it's in compliance that's how it's written in the state law um, I like it <laughs> we'll see how that goes we'll see how challenging today well, <laughs> they, they did specify easy. that they do letter, not letter certify of the law, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not a certification as it is under the Coastal Commission. It is uh -huh. a required certification. So our recommended action tonight is to approve the first reading, waiving the reading of the text of the proposed ordinance as amending Title 17 to align with the recent state requirements for ADUs, floor area ratio, and single family residents with an accessory dwelling unit. And that recommended action in yeah. regard to parking? We can come back to the options after. The public hearing. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Now is the time uh, for public comment on this item. If anyone would like to address the council on this item, now would be the time. Any member of the public? Yes, please. Hi. Welcome. Uh, hi. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Patrick Katie. Uh, I live in Cliffwood Heights. Um, uh, I'm here to speak in support of ADUs. Um, 
or the the idea of ADUs, I guess. Um, I think they're like a really practical way um, our community um, can make a dent in the region-wide housing crisis. Um, I spoke to one of my neighbors uh, in Cliffwood Heights um, who is really interested in in constructing a, an ADU on uh, on his property um, and using it for himself to and uh, to to rent out um, his primary residence. Uh, and I I think that's like a good thing uh, that the council should like encourage uh, with the regulations and uh, rules that that you're considering. Um, he was concerned about the like myriad like fines and regulations that he'd have to comply with um, to get an ADU built though. Um, I feel like, and you talked about it tonight, like these, the all the rules that you set with with good intentions, they they all serve to disincentivize housing. Um, I feel like um, this uh, this community should try to encourage more housing. Um, I I absolutely love it in Capitola, but um, if I could afford to live in the place I grew up in in Silicon Valley, like. I would have also loved to stay there. And I feel like um, there's lots of families in my neighborhood in Clipwood Heights, and I feel like their children would also love to, to stay in, in Capitola. And I feel like these um, ADU construction like would help with that. It, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, welcome. Thank you, uh, Jerry Jensen. Um, so I have an ADU, and I went through the process about five years ago. And I was just wondering, I haven't heard a lot about Soquel Waters interaction, and maybe I missed those parts of um, part of it. Like, but for when I had an ADU, we had to have a second water meter. And so there, you know, when I went to that whole process, you know, it was the building uh, mil moratorium days, and they were not allowing water meters, and you know, it took north of six months and so so I was wondering how that interaction is happening with um, water and if you go to if we went up to a, a SoCal water district meeting you know they're talking about salt water intrusion and they want to limit building in the area uh, so there is no more construction I mean it kind of defies what we're all talking about for having more housing but you know they're worried about more water, water usage in the area and having the salt water intrusion and I was wondering how that interaction was happening between this overlay because I went through the whole process of um, very long. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other member of the public? Yes. Hello, welcome. <clears throat> My name is Noreen Huber and I live at Capitola Greens, which was one of the <laughs> places that you had up there just by chance. Um, I already, I feel that it's already high density and I couldn't see the look of concern on your face, but I certainly share it because parking is already an issue. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult to find parking even on 42nd Street. Um, we have residents parking on 42nd Street because they can't find parking in our, in our units because uh, the parking in our units is limited because there are a lot of people sharing um, units and they have more cars than there are slots. So um, I really encourage you to think about um, the unintended consequences of that kind of, um, of, the, of allowing that kind of garage uh, conversion into ADUs. I think that would just be a big mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for further discussion. Any other comments or questions? Well, I, <laughs> okay, council member story, go ahead. I may. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, uh, just my comments um, um, concerning now this evolution concerning the ADUs. Um, um, and, um, you know, when it came to us before, I had taken the position that um, we, we are a very dense community. And we are very, you know, car traffic um, um, dense community. And that's in the 40 years I've lived there, it has always been an issue that we've attempted to grapple with. 
and now we're being imposed upon with state regulations and it's not to take away with the issue of housing it's, housing is very important um, however housing what what comes along with it is traffic and I think that we have to balance and manage both of those issues at the same time it seems to me the only way and what I would encourage us to do is to take a very limited approach. I, I believe the state regulations are already very permissive um, and that we're going to see a greater and greater proliferation of higher density within existing residential areas which are going to create more traffic and cars. Um, and I think that's going to deteriorate the quality of life in many of our neighborhoods. It's already severely impacted. I think that it will impact cultural access because all those available parking lots are going to be taken by the residents that live in those um, ADUs and in that housing. That's going to take away from the businesses because people won't be able to come down uh, and be able to go find a place to park, to go shop. Um, and so um, I think that we should um, enter into this very um, um, gingerly with um, I, I think with the, uh, as much um, wait and see uh, approach as we can uh, to see what the real impacts are um, and for that I would uh, encourage the council to take the most restrictive approach and to require that if there's going to be an ADU in the coastal zone that they provide additional off street parking um, and um, I think that that will give us an opportunity to, to assess how this is going. I'm willing to allow the exception in Cliffwood Heights now that I understand the Planning Commission's reasons for it uh, because they in essence didn't want to see a bunch of cars parked in front yards um, and um, well on the actual lawn they parked in front of the houses. Um, but I think I get that approach and I think that that would apply as well to the single family houses on Kennedy and Balboa. Um, so um, I'm willing to limit it to just, um, the, well, the options one and options two that are listed up there. But I would also like to look at us, um, um, maybe do, do a study of the impacts of ADUs, so particularly, well, how many applications are we getting? Uh, how many have been approved, how many, where are they in the area, and maybe bring us back a report in a year so we can see the impacts of these, how successful we've been. Um, and at that point, you know, maybe we could uh, provide more leniency. But I just also want to recognize that we are um, not a, we have the most mobile homes. We have the most multifamily apartments, condominiums. Uh, in any square foot in this county. Um, so we are heavily uh, impacted. Um, we are also looking at the mall and of adding 600 new residential units. So there's going to be a lot coming on us and I think that we should just try to absorb and manage this uh, as best we can. Um, so that's why I would propose that the council adopt uh, items one and two. Is that a motion or just comment? Yes, I'll make that a motion. Wait, adopt one and two. One or two. Yes. It would. Um, it would have to be one or two. Correct. Oh, uh, well, it's one, with the exception for Cliffwood Heights, which is. So that would be two. two. Yeah. So two, it's one it, and two. Um, it's number two. It's number two. Yeah. It's just two. The Planning Commission recommendation. Because their recommendation was for all properties within the coastal zone except the single family in Cliffwood Heights. Okay, adopt the ordinance as drafted, and the ordinance as drafted includes the required parking within the coastal zone. That's what, okay, I got it. So, and my motion is to adopt option number two. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll agree to that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll continue for uh, discussion. Sure. Um, Can I just add the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, so the motion also includes the waiver of, re, of full reading? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thank yes. you. Uh -huh. oh boy. I, um, I appreciate Council Member Story's comments. I, um, I too think it's really important that we look at 
our housing stock. And I think that the city of Capitola is going to be doing its due diligence in creating what we're looking to cl be close to over 600 and something apartments. <clears throat> I do want to add, though, that those apartments will have their own parking included on the property. And I just want to make sure that I, I say that publicly um, so that people aren't assuming that it's just going to be out randomly on the streets. Um, now, I, I do have concerns of not implementing or not requiring parking in Cliffwood Heights. And the reason for that is, be, is for the opposite. It's for the opposite purpose. And that's because it is the least impacted. <laughs> And it has it, and it, it's important to maintain. If it's important for us to maintain the quality of life as is, Cliffwood Heights has already established a um, its own quality of life, and it is not as impacted. And is if you can see on during Halloween when people come on the streets, uh, hundreds of people come and and are able to walk around freely in that community because of of the fact that there are not a lot of folks that live on there. I myself live in that area and am able to see that on a daily basis. So um, I, I, wouldn't ag I would not agree with the motion on the table. I would, um, I would if you would accept my amendment to uh, that all, all areas in the coastal com um, zone would require parking is what I'm thinking and to come back in a year with those numbers to see if where we're at similarly to what council member story is saying and like we said the last time what is this gonna look like in a year what and in 60 days or whenever Katie you get the feedback we might be back here again <laughs> talking about well we can't do that and we got to change it again so I think staying with status quo of how it has always been since we now have that as an option, um, and then coming back to see what that feedback from the Coastal Commission is and so forth. Do you have any more comments? I have a comment, but I'll go after you. you know, I, if we adopt number two, and you know, we could reassess this in a year, I, I, do with, I would like to see an addition in terms of coming back in a year and, and having our city planning you know, looking at this um, there's, you know, as uh, Yvette talked about, how many applications have we had? You know, what, what is the state of the city moving forward in response to the change in the California regulations? And I agree, as you pointed out, that the interest is going to increase. Uh, one of the main issues um, was water, as uh, was brought up by Jerry, but another issue was parking. Parking increases the cost of construction considerably, so that's been relaxed. And so I think more people are going to be thinking of this as an option. And also funding, and there's a lot of construction um, companies that are actually um, focused on ADUs. And so I think the options are going to increase for people to take advantage of this. So if we take uh, the opportunity to track this moving forward, and if we see that there are some issues that are exasperated by this that we have some control over, and I agree with um, Sam on this. this. This is going to exasperate many problems in this city. But if we have some data to show what is actually happening, then we could, could consider a response to that. All right. Um, this whole thing, this whole item has been rather concerning to me because of this kind of fuzziness and confusion between what does the Coastal Act say and what does the state say and what have we said and what do we say now? And, that all, I just, I feel very uncomfortable with that in general. Um, that being said, it seems like we're just going to have to move forward with a little bit of discomfort until we get some more understanding from, from the state. And so I'll, I will accept that. Um, when I think about some of these things, I think about, you know, there could be a, a two-bedroom house with a two-car driveway, and it's got a, a couple living in it, and they're adult children fall on hard times and all of a sudden you've got their adult children and their spouses and their children and now it's a family of nine in a two-bedroom house and that's not unheard of especially in the place you know in our community where housing is so tight you see these places there where people are crammed into housing and we don't ever consider in those kind of situations if those people need more parking because their residency has gone up we're always going by square footage and floor area ratio and lot size and understandably um, but it, it makes it makes it also concerning to me to think that well 
they could put that their adult children that needed to move in with them into this ADU now and not have to worry about it, but we are requiring parking for them. So that's concerning. Um, that being said, the slide that you showed with the apartment complex suddenly having 25% of its carports turned into uh, units was, was really kind of shocking and, and surprised me. Um, and as someone who doesn't even have a carport, um, let alone a parking space <laughs> and drives around the village all day trying to find a parking space after work. Um, I would hate to see that even the carports that my neighbors do have um, are now uh, studios and none of us have parking spaces. Um, so that is concerning. So I can see how places like Riverview, um, the village, uh, those kind of Depot Hill to a certain extent would be incredibly impacted by not requiring parking for these kind of um, situations. I also can see how uh, Cliffwood Heights is is kind of less impacted so far. And I guess in, in this line of thinking, are we allowed to restrict the number of ADUs that we allow to do this? We're not allowed to do any kind of restrictions on it? No. Huh? No, I mean like per year. Can, is, oh. can we, can we, oh. we can't restrict how many ADU permits we give out. So if we say, if I, if I go with the motion and say, um, we're gonna require parking for all ADUs in the coastal zone with exception for Cliffwood Heights, but we're gonna review this in a year, then in a year, the most we could do is say, okay, now parking's also required in Cliffwood Heights. Is that correct? Correct. Assuming there are not a slate of additional changes in that a year. That could come through, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, we have a motion in a second. Are we ready to call the question? Well, I, uh, we want to. Councilmember Brooks had made uh, a, what I what I believe is a substitute motion. But Did you make a substitute motion? Yes. Oh. I didn't know whether to call it a substitute motion or a friendly amendment, but I'm looking to our. Can you say what it was again? Um, option one. Option one. So I think that would need to be a substitute because it's different than the motion on the floor. It eviscerates my motion. So it eviscerates his right. motion. Yeah. It's so friendly. It's an unfriendly amendment. Anybody. You can make an unfriendly amendment. I would like to make a substitute motion. Substitute motion. I, I, I would like to make that substitute motion that council adopt option one with the intent of coming back in a year and the other things that council member story mentioned. We have a motion, do we have a second? So motion dies for lack of a second? Okay, so then we don't vote on that, we go back to the first motion? That's right. Okay, let's do a roll call vote on the first motion. Council members Story. Aye. Brooks. Aye. Bertrand. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Always su full of surprises. <laughs> okay. Can I make a general comment? I'm sorry? Can I make a general comment? About that item? Yeah, yeah about the whole thing. <laughs> uh, briefly, before we, while the slide's being pulled up. I, I, I think we're in on, uncharted area, and I think the whole communities, all the communities in California are going to be feeling a lot of angst about this issue, and um, I don't know what the future is going to be, but I hope we struggle through it in a way to actually deal with the intent, which is to provide adequate housing in our communities and figure out a way to deal with the subsequent problems that are sure going to happen. Thank you. All right, we're moving on. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, I'm here to talk about our environmentally acceptable packing materials ordinance. A um, little background, in 2006, the city added Municipal Code Chapter 8.36, that's the Environmental the, uh, Acceptable Packaging Materials Ordinance. The, the primary goal of that ordinance was actually dealing with polystyrene foam, uh, styrofoam, um, and it was actually very successful. Um, but there is a, inclusion, uh, a section part of that code that requires all food vendors to use biodegradable and compostable items for single-use food service, including straws. Um, the truth was, at that time, that we were way ahead of the curve. 
there were no products out there um, in 2006. So it didn't get enforced very much. There wasn't much done with it. We, again, focused pr primarily on the styrofoam piece of it. But in the last four or five years, we have been trying to get more and more um, businesses um, to move in this direction. Um, enforcement has been complaint-based. We have sent on multiple times communications explaining the ordinance to businesses. Um, we have even uh, contracted with nonprofits to go out and do outreach and education on this ordinance. Um, to varying degrees of success. So what we've done is we've contacted other jurisdictions. See, see, check on their enforcement programs because this is becoming more and more common. Like I said, we, we put this on the books in 2006. Um, I think the county was just ahead of us, but no one else had this. Um, and again, it was probably a little early for the compostable and biodegradable piece of it because the products were just not there. Um, so as other jurisdictions have come online, um, I kind of checked to see where they're where they're going. A lot of these are coastal communities. That's where kind of the focus originally was. Um, all the programs are complaint based. Um, at this time, the ones I've spoken to, um, none have actually levied fines on on um, businesses. Um, they're working with the kind of the kind of way we are work trying to find solutions to this. Where we're saying, okay, here here's what the products you're not using that are that are incorrect, and here's what you're supposed to go to. Um, Coming up in this county, um, within the next year, at least three jurisdictions, I believe the county and the cities of Santa Cruz and the cities of Watsonville are gonna start requiring a charge for to-go cups, very similar to the way we do uh, to-go bags at the store. Um, and we, in our code, we talk about um, compostable and biodegradable products. Um, some jurisdictions are going a little step further and requiring what they call fiber-based, as opposed to the um, the, the plastic-like products that look like kind of look like plastic, the clear ones that are made out of um, you know cornstarch and other materials, they're going straight to the the fiber-based ones because even with the biodegradable type pla plastic alternatives, there are issues with composting. And honestly, when they what we found out is when if they do get out in the sea, they have very similar properties to regular plastic. Um, Commission on Environment did review this. Um, they did give some feedbacks as far as enforcement, but there were no formal recommendations. So moving forward, some of the options we have are to continue with our current program with complaint-based enforcement. Um, we can perform additional outreach to the business community either through additional staff time devoted to the effort or maybe a new agreement with a, a, the same or another nonprofit to see if that, they can get out there and get more people involved. Um, we can modify the enforcement program. We can also um, modify existing code. This is one of the things that the, uh, the one of the notes that the, the Commission on Environment had is to include more guidance for businesses in complying and more substantial penalties for those businesses that don't comply. So as I, now I'm willing to answer any questions you have. Questions for staff? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so I think the law changed recently that says um, you could bring a container and have it fill with like coffee or some other liquid that you know you're getting. And one of the issues I like I've been doing this for about ten years or more, <laughs> but one of the issues I find all the time is that um, some businesses don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll fill that up with uh, whatever styrofoam container and you know you pour it in or something of that sort. So is this a place to adopt the California code in this particular regard? Well, I, I, would, I would guess if it is California code that you're discussing, we, we already have to comply like that. Kind of like the, um, the straw ordinance about if you eat in, in a, a restaurant, they, you actually have to request a straw. Um, they don't talk, the, the California code doesn't talk plastic or um, biodegradable. They just said no, no straws unless you ask for them. Um, I do know that, um, as you're talking, there are some businesses that believe it's a food safety issue, filling other people's cups with their equipment. So I know it's a, there's some conflict, and um, I, I don't know where that stands. But, I mean, we, we definitely, if it's a California rule, we, uh, we're obligated to, they're obligated to follow that. So if it's a California rule, would this, or, uh, would this um, our ordinance dealing with recyclables, would that be a place to include that? Um, 
I don't know. I'd have to look and see what, what rule that is. If, if there's anything specific in that, I'd have to look to see what um, California code that is. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. And also in regards to what we just talked about in terms of ADU, the state's jumping in and mm -hmm. telling us what to do in regards to that. Is there any uh, movement to do that in regards to recycling and being a little more stringent in how we deal with these issues? Um, not specifically with the food um, products. Most of what's coming down from the state right now are diversions of specifically with organics right now. That's the biggest. Um, we are still this obligated, or we're still under um, requirement to move. Like if it is recyclable plastic, it's supposed to be diverted. We have those ratios. But as far as the food war ordinance, nothing that I know of has been has come down that would, is from the state that would would match this. Okay. Questions? Yes, Council Member Story. Larry, who's the um, the nonprofit that we had hired to do outreach? Uh, we did Save Our Shores. Save Our Shores. Yes. Okay. Uh, now is the time for public comment on this item. If there is any member of the public that would like to address the council, now would be the time. Going once. Oh, all right. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Her and Hannah. Um, so I, I'm just curious as far as, um, so you require the restaurant, if there's any to-go packaging or anything, to be compostable or fiber-based. But the customer who takes it out and then sits at the seawall and eats it, that's a problem because they either put it in the garbage. I guess if they throw it on the ground, it's better because it's, it's not going to hurt the environment as much. But um, if it goes, if they think, oh, this is compostable, therefore I put it in the recycling, I think we all know that the recycling now goes with the garbage in the village. It's not, it, it doesn't get picked up separately to go off and be sor sorted. So are we making any progress on having a better system to capture the, um, the trash? Because it seems, I still think it's probably, I mean, maybe it's a still a good idea to force all the restaurants to use all the, the compostable fiber-based materials, but shouldn't we, shouldn't the city then be doing their part to try and uh, educate and help the public to put these in, in the right containers so that if there is something recyclable, it can be recycled. If there is something compostable, it can be compo composted, or if it's garbage, it goes in the garbage. I think we're, you know, it, there's, a, there's a balance there. The businesses have to do their share, city has to do their share so the public can hopefully do their share. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Comments? Comments? I, I agree with Karin that it would be nice if the public respected our uh, recyclable containers and we make them available and we label them. Um, but I think in the rush on the weekends especially or when we have an event, they just get stuffed irrespective of what they're, what they're made for. Um, I think there was a time we were thinking about getting a um, a trash container that um, crushed the trash and used the, um, the sun, it was a UV type thing, you know, to run this thing. And so the volume would be much greater. We could, we could actually, and there's some that are available that are actually, you put them in the ground. There's, you know, you make a cavity in the ground and so they, they handle tons of garbage. And even then, <laughs> I think people would put almost anything in it, which is unfortunate. So I think a lot of this depends on the public. Um, we do provide garbage cans that are adequately labeled, I believe. This is uh, an embarrassing question because I live in the village, but do we have recycling bins in the village? Y yes, we do. Separate the, the, from garbage the, cans? The, the blue ones um, are generally the recycling ones and the brown ones are the, the trash. Often, as uh, Councilmember Batron mentioned, on a busy weekend, you can't tell the difference. There, yeah. it, it's whatever first option is available. Um, so, is the recycling picked up and sorted? Uh, the recycling bins, if they are not, the, if the contamination levels aren't excessive, they take them to the uh, Greenways takes them to the uh, um, the their materials recycling facility in San Jose and runs through and, and separates and that sort of thing. If 
it, if they are too um, contaminated, then they go to the landfill and marina. That's that's what I was wondering because I remember someone came a couple whiles, a couple months back and gave us a presentation about where things go in recycling bins and all that. And I specifically asked him, is it true that if you put too much non-recyclable stuff in a recycling bin that none of it can be recycled? And he said, no, it's just more expensive. So who determines? I mean, I don't I don't mean to get too far off track here. I'm just trying to to, to set a baseline for if what we're doing is going to make a difference. So I think the answer you got to your question was technically correct. It could be separated and recycled, but it isn't. Why? Well, it has to do with where we take our recycling. We take our recycling over the hill, correct. right? To the green take, waste facility. And we take our to the green waste facility and we take our trash to the marine landfill. And so in general, I think um, Karen Hanna is correct in that the recycling bins in the village generally end up going to the marina land waste facility and then don't go through that th that sorter. Doesn't that marina land waste facility have like a state-of-the-art recycling center? They, they do, but currently that's part of the long-term agreement that we, were, we had been talking about is that not all of our stuff currently goes through their, their MRF, as they call it. Um, eventually, all of it will. That's, okay. that's, but, but it is still much, as you point out, much less expensive to keep the recycling in the what they call the clean MRF and then the other stuff will get separated, but just not to the same level. And if they go through the trash. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna try to get us back to the compostable <laughs> stuff, but I, I would like a future agenda item to discuss this whole green waste versus marina landfill and recycling and, and all that stuff. Cause I think I've been to that marina landfill and they've got like a state of the art center and the guy stood here and told me, yeah, we'll sort that through you for, through, uh, through for you. Um, so I, yeah. I'd like to discuss that further at another time. Um, I'm almost done, I promise. I know I kind of went on a, on a side rant there. Um, now I can't remember, so I'll come back to it. Council Member Story. Well, thank you. I just wanted to, on that topic about educating the public um, and trash versus recycling versus compostable, the Art and Cultural Commission had um, actually taken on a project several months back uh, to look at um, putting uh, more attractive uh, receptacles of the various types um, in the village. Um, and, and as a component of that, it would have an educational message that would kind of encourage and help people put things in the right places. Um, um, you know, however, you know, the Arts Commission actually had to abandon that project, or we dropped it, because um, our limited bandwidth concerning uh, just the aesthetics of such a project uh, weren't enough to tackle the engineering uh, and the uh, city equipment um, needs uh, for a project like that or what the village merchants may need and want in that area. Um, and I think we just realized, well, this is a huge project and we don't necessarily uh, have the capacity uh, to carry something like that forward on our own. Um, so, but there was that interest there. Maybe there's still a spark if the council was, was so inclined uh, at maybe coming back to looking at that project, uh, maybe on a more citywide and a collaborative basis. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks? Yeah, so I think the intent of compostable is if it does not land in a recyclable container, that it will compost in the trash much more quickly, in the landfill much more quickly than, say, a plastic or whatever else that doesn't compost. You know, it takes some items like straws take hundreds of years. So I think for, for us to really um, create a process to utilize, and I guess this will be my, are we there yet? Can I make? Yeah, I already uh, went to public. Okay, so I think, um, you guys were looking for for some direction direction here and i was thinking that we can utilize our current staff or volunteers to um to implement a proactive annual sweep of how we're doing with throughout our businesses throughout our restaurants um and i i read in the staff report that it, there's some sort of training that can be involved and perhaps we can look at some of our volunteers, maybe um, beginning with our environmental commission and giving them that sort of direction. But I'll leave that to the discretion of staff. Um, but once that initial letter goes out to all businesses, 
it would be great if we can have a, a fast turnaround, say, like in 90 days. If in 90 days you do not comply with our ordinance or policy, I can't remember which it is, but um, then we will enforce. And I think that's really important that we start enforcing. You said it's been since 2016, was what, yeah, six, nine? Well, the, the ordinance uh, was first written in 2006. 2006. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's time that we can start enforcing this um, on a more annual basis and really taking the initiative there. I, um, thanks to you, Larry, we were able to see some fast turnaround with one of our local restaurants, um, busy restaurants. And so kudos to you for to really stepping, stepping up the game in that and making it happen because I think our restaurants are willing to make it happen. They just haven't been asked um, more sternly <laughs> recently. So, um, and in regards to the nonprofit, I don't know that we need to, but again, if that, if this process doesn't work, if the environmental commission can't pick it up or we can't find um, one of our, I'm looking at the chief because I, I can't believe it. maybe our PTO, our parking enforcement person can help take something on like this. What are, you know, there's different routes to go through this, but I think we can use, utilize our current volunteers and staff to, to actually enforce this. I have a question. Which one of those options are you suggesting? I just made that one up. I don't, know. <laughs> um, Do I, I don't so have to go with one of those options. No, you don't, but you're suggesting <laughs> enforcement, and so I'm, I'm trying to yeah, figure out, are so you saying current complaint-based enforcement? Or no, I, because that's not working. The annual checkup, I think, either way, well, the it's current, not bad just to do an annual how are we doing in our community. Right, because the complaint-based enforcement has literally been me saying I've been to a <laughs> restaurant and it's not working. Like, it's, I mean, Oops. that's not the process. And, you know, we don't create policies here in, you know, not to to be enforced or, you know, we really need to think think about the long term impacts of uh, the environmental impacts of plastics. And that's why this policy was created in 2006. So I don't know when you want to annually start this process, the sooner the better. Um, and I think I it, I would leave it to that to our staff to figure out who's going to actually implement um, the enforcement piece, if it's going to be a volunteer that goes through the training process or a staff member that continues, I don't know, Larry, if that's something you would, it would go on you, but, um, or perhaps you come back to us with more information on, on a process, okay. but. So I just want to, I'm sorry, Lynn, I'm, the current process is complaint based so if we were to do more active enforcement I believe we would have to come back with a modified um, uh, uh, code adjustment change I believe because I don't know that it says that I don't think so yeah okay. I don't think it says it okay. like I don't think it says a complaint based enforcement process I mean I think if we're, if we're going to shift to a active enforcement model and actually be writing people tickets for this I think we have to have a real clear understanding about what that means. Um, I think a one-time sweep through the existing businesses is something that we can arrange, you know, we can work it into the existing workload. I think building that in the expectation that that's something that we're actively doing on an ongoing basis, I think we would need to come back with either sort of a work plan implications or budget implications about how we could effectively do that. Yeah, it says here the city manager or designee will have primary responsibility for the enforcement of this chapter. So <laughs> I'm glad I made that recommendation for staff to come back with a plan on enforcement. Um, I would suggest 90 days, that businesses have 90 days to comply, and then we start the enforcement process. See you on the esplanade off of the clipboard. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> it says or designee. Um, can I make a, uh, I don't know if it's an, an amendment or a friendly amendment um, but I would ask that if we're going to move forward with some kind of enforcement um, code that we and I and I hesitate to do this because I feel like we do this and then people don't want to get involved or we don't know how to get them involved but I think it would be important to have the business owners involved in this so that we understand how long reasonably they believe that they could be able to make these changes what kind of fiscal impacts it would have to their business um, I, I just think that we should do it with, with them in mind. This is important. It's clear, it's in our code that we need to make sure that we're doing what we can, 
um, to not use things like polystyrene foam. Um, but I, I also, I want to make sure that our businesses aren't put at, at an undue burden, our business owners in the village. If we say, you've got 90 days to do this, and they say, well, I've got a 120-day supply of plastic cartons right now. I, I just, I, I can't yeah, think of every no, contingency. I, I, I just want to make sure that our business community is involved in, in, right. in this and not just talked at about it. Well, what I would what I would say is that we look back in 2006 and what the process was. When this policy went into place, how long did businesses have to comply? And I think that's important to look back on because I can't imagine that this was created without our business owners participating in the conversation. Um, and so I'm guessing that there was some sort of conversation and some sort of, you know, you have until the first of the year to, to do this. So. Um, maybe we can go back in the minutes and see how this was actually enforced originally. Because, I mean, I see your point, Mayor Peterson, um, but it's a, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably, you know, that process happened and sure. that they had, um, they had that, yeah. that opportunity already. Well, I'm also looking at definitions where it says affordable means purchasable by the food vendor for the same or less purchase cost than the non-biodegradable, non-polystyrene foam alternative. So if we're going to enforce, they, I mean, they clearly have the option to show us that it wasn't affordable for them to do that, right? And I, I believe the, they can file for a, an exemption and the mm -hmm. city manager okay. or designee can give a... Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want it to sound like I'm saying, you right. know, forget it. We Correct. should all go back to using styrofoam, but I am. No, I just want to make sure that we're including all the parties involved here in a way that's fair and, mm -hmm. and, and, and equitable. I, yeah, Council Member Bertrand. So, um, you know, I agree with the general tenor of this discussion as it's going that we do have to involve others in the community, especially the merchants that are going to be the ones to enforce or change their business habits. Um, but I take note that some businesses are starting to, like Gail's recently, came out with a, a wonderful ad about um, the, the steps that they're taking in terms of green and sustainability efforts. And I think other businesses are going to take note of these movements in general because this is what customers are going to. We, we have a store in town called Zero, right? And you know this is their whole business thing in terms of responding to the public's desire to not waste and to find ways to um, still do things in terms of eating, et cetera, et cetera, that aren't wasteful and are sustainable. So I think when this first came out, um, we were working. We, you, uh, your counterpart, you know, went to merchants and talked to them and figured out what would work. And it was very much a an issue of how can we do this together. It, it wasn't a cudgel of any sort, even though the ordinance provides for that. And my sense is that that is the most effective way, and I think is taking advantage of the fact that merchants want to do this, and how can they do it, and maybe the council of commission or the city could provide ways to make this a little easier for them, or work with their suppliers so that they could come up with alternate supply, but give them time to do this. I, I don't want to see anything that forces people to do things. I've had two businesses in the past and had the city come to me and force me to do something when it's truly costly and doesn't run in terms of my plan to run that business effectively would be really a detriment. So I support working with the merchants, broaden our, uh, expo uh, our outreach to the merchants that we need to work with in terms of these particular issues. And you know, I agree with Yvette. You know, if we have something on the, you know, if we have something one of our ordinances, you know, it sort of begs the question, you know. But there's a lot of things in this city. I mean, we're not supposed to have dogs on the beach. I mean, there's there's tons of things here that we sort of work around because we want the community to work. And our part of this is to help facilitate that. We'll come back with a work plan for that. And is that the... Do, do I, I mean, I think I need, I'd like a motion yeah. and a vote to figure out where we're going because I'm hearing different council members say different things. I think I've heard three different things at this point. Well, let me just add that it states here in the, I, I'm, what I'm getting at is that I'm not creating anything new. What I'd like to see is the implementation of this policy. I would like for us to see this actually take effect in our community without 
without just this complaint-based enforcement that we've been going by. So it says here in our packet that there was a study one year after the effective date of this ordinance codified in this chapter, the city manager will conduct a study on the effectiveness of this chapter. So perhaps we need to start there. Perhaps we need to look at and study the effectiveness of this. And then that will help us gauge on whether there's an, this necessitates amendments or a different um, approach. So if, I, let me respond. So um, I'll go along with that as part of a motion. And I would like to have a work plan as a second component of the motion. And maybe we should approach this like we do in city planning. We, we have a green standard for building, OK? And we don't have that necessarily for doing businesses. You know, if we could come up with something in the work plan that is a positive push or a positive pull so the business would want to be identified as a green business or as a sustainable business, and maybe we could provide the framework to do that. And that would be incorporated perhaps in a work plan. And I think this would be an ongoing thing, something that would evolve over time because I think we're all new in this and this is um, difficult because we don't really have adequate places to recycle. We, it, it's an imperfect system right now. So I support Yvette in terms of um, doing a work plan and looking at this going forward and coming back in a year. Is that how you put it? Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say come back in a year. I would like to see this work plan and study come back to us much sooner than a year. I could um, go along with that. I'd love yeah. to yeah. save our oceans as quickly as possible. Okay. Well, if you make a motion, I think I'm ready to second it with those general ideas. Can I make a comment beforehand? Before, if I mean, feel free to make a motion at any time, but I would like to make a comment also that um, the point that Karen brought up, I think, is also very important to consider is that our, we could have our merchants doing all this, and then people are going to go down and throw it on the ground or in a garbage can and it won't matter so if we're not doing outreach through save our shores to our businesses and we're actually actively working with our businesses as a city i think it would be important to still use save our shores to do some kind of community education in some way or another i don't know what that means i don't know if that means we get those three garbage cans where one of them's garbage one's recycle and one's compost and it's all in one long thing i don't know if that means stickers i don't know if that means if flyers campaign i don't know um, but I think that we could continue to work with Save Our Shores in a way that does community education um, and community outreach. And if um, you believe that that would mm -hmm. be important. Council Member Story, do you, um, the Arts and Cultural Commission took that on for, for the outside, for the, um, the art component. Do you see the that? Aesthetics, the yeah. aesthetics, thank <laughs> you. Um, do you think this would be something that, I, I know that the Environmental Commission hasn't recently been tasked with something but perhaps this could be, we could extend this to them to look at in terms of the, the garbages and recycling components. We, we do direct the various commissions to do things. And in that sense, I have no problem with that. I think that's workable. Get we more. recently discussed this. Can someone refresh my yeah, memory? I Are we to allowed to give this? To look, into, look in, can you please look into whether the Environmental Commission can take on the, um, would want to would want to take on. Doesn't it yeah. have to take a motion by a majority? It would just need it would yeah. need to be a direction from the full council. But I do think that we've been doing some work on the trash cans internally at this point. Was that Steve mm -hmm. or was that you, Larry? Um, we we have talked about it, both staff, uh, public works, and we started with the arts commission. I just don't know where we are on that. But we've looked at we started looking at alternatives to what we have down there to help. You know what we found is the the more uniform you make it, mm. the more um, visually clear you make it, it, mm. it, it works better. Mm -hmm. It's not a hundred percent. Sure. So we we the staff has talked about that, and now that the the arts commission just felt it was a little beyond the scope of their mission, we are going to be setting up. We're going to be talking again to see what we can do internally to find better solutions out there. Right. So, so we could take that conversation to our uh, to commission on the environment if that's part of a motion and direction from council. Was there a motion? I, I haven't heard a motion yet. I, I move that we take this issue of how to better facilitate our recycling in terms of whether it's the receptacles 
or a much wider, uh, wider uh, brush, you know, in working with the merchants, and work with staff to come up with a working plan to come back to uh, City Council. And uh, Yvette would like it a little sooner than later, so there's some, I don't know, 60 days or 90 days, something that would be not a year. I'll we second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Questions? No? Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on to item 8D, receive a report on historic carousel. As they say, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, so um, this is a, a staff report and a presentation. Oh. Do, would you like me to take a recess? Let's take know? let's take a, a two three minute break, and we will return. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to return to our meeting. Uh, item eight D. <clears throat> excuse me. Eight D. Report on historic carousel. Okay. as seen in the painting behind us. Um, yes, that's that's all right. Mayor, council <laughs> members, thank you. Um, so this is a little different. Um, so there's another uh, initial image of the carousel we're actually talking about. This is in the 50s. Um, this is not the first carousel, but it was the last one we had. So we, the city of Capitola had a carousel running near the beach for uh, off and on during the early part of the 20th century. Um, the last one, the image we just saw, um, ran from about 1955 to about 1965. Um, th one of the reasons they finally had to get rid of it what had to do with the, um, the lack of beach in Capitola at the time because of the harbor. Um, the waves were just hitting the, the, the carousel even in the summertime. So they ended up taking it away. I think it was set up a couple more times after that. Um, but never at that, that location. The carousel in question is about 35 feet in diameter. Um, it is made of aluminum horses. It is not, they are not wood horses. Um, interesting enough, they were originally built um, near Moffett Field, where they had expertise in building other sorts of aluminum things. And they started a business right after World War II and decided to build aluminum horses. Um, this carousel was designed to be installed and removed every year. It's similar to ones you see at some of the, the uh, um, you know, the, the, the fairs, the, the county fairs, where they pick, they set them up for a week, take them down. It, it is designed to be portable. Um, a lot of them, they have, they, they go in the back of semi trucks and move around. So it is not, you know, I just want to set the expert. It is not like the one, the, the um, boardwalk, which is solid wood and that sort of thing. This was, this was you know, a very functional, but, you know, didn't have the same aesthetics at the time. Um, based on research and the best information we have, the carousel um, that was in Capitola was relocated to Casa de Fruta, and then when they bought a new carousel, they sold it to the Red Barn Flea Market in Aromas. Um, it was operating into at least the early 2000s. Um, this is the last, the picture of what it looked like. I don't know if you remember the last one, uh, what it looked like here. But it's significantly different. Mm -hmm. They added a lot. At some point, they had a lot of um, um, aesthetic choices to it. So this is actually kind of what it looks like right now. Um, it, apparently, at least one other time in 1999, the city attempted to purchase this carousel from the Red Barn, and they had no interest in selling it at the time. Um, however, in 2016, the city was contacted by the operator of the Red Barn asking to see if we had interest in it. Um, we had some, some, an expert go out there with myself and um, the museum curator look at it. Well, we couldn't determine exactly if it was the one that was out here because so much has been changed. It was definitely the right manufacturer, the right vintage, the right size, all that sort of thing. So we're pretty comfortable with that. Um, unfortunately, at the time, there was just too big of a difference um, by what we believed it was worth and what the, the operator of the... Uh, um, Red Barn believed it was worth, so um, nothing ever went forward to it. 
Currently, the red barn is in escrow, and there's a, a fiduciary person in charge of liquidating the assets. They got in touch with us a few months ago to see if we could. I, I followed up to make sure that before they did anything, at least they would contact us um, to see if we still had interest in it. So we did. I did take another trip out there, um, and basically, it it's, hasn't changed. Um, the, some of the rehabilitation had been started. Fif Fifteen or so of the twenty horses. Um, have at least started to be repainted. Um, so someone was trying to get this up and running and just didn't get anywhere. There's, uh, there's, some, uh, there's some work that needs to be done to get it up and running, but at least the horses are in good shape. Um, they've been inside, so they're not, they haven't degraded a whole lot even the last few years. Um, some of the things we're, we are not sure of, and there's a lot of things with a carousel, and you know, we don't know what we need to do if we did Get it, what it would take to get up and running, both you know, it, as it is right now, and then some of the California state requirements. Um, we don't know the cost to restore. Um, I did talk to a, a professional restorer, and he he had looked at them with me, and um, he said the five remaining horses probably about twenty five to thirty hours worth of work to get them back into the other ones. He said just you know very little time because they're in, in pretty good shape. Um, Again, we would definitely need to store the carousel initially um, if that was the decision and we think we have a place. Um, Liquidator believes because this is being done by, um, uh, managed by fiduciary person, finance person, as well as attorneys, um, they would have to bring a, a number back to them for approval. Um, and he believes based on his you know, appraisal information, um, about fifteen thousand dollars would probably be approved. That is is in line with what we had seen in two thousand sixteen, as far as what the value was. And that, unfortunately, the, back then they, there was just they, they thought there was a, basically half a million dollars is what they thought it was worth. So um, we just couldn't get anything done at that time. So this is, is this isn't out of line with what we we saw back in two thousand sixteen. So um, with that, I think I'm. Well, here's a, some of the directions. If you do wish to purchase it, um, staff suggests that you authorize the city manager to negotiate a purchase agreement to bring back to future for future council consideration. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Yes. Do you have, do you have I don't have a question, but I do have a point I just want to add. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I want to make it clear that that the city doesn't have on staff carousel experts. Um, yeah. I want to set the expectations. I don't. Yes, I want to set the expectations very clear. Oh, if they aren't already abundantly clear, um, I, I think if the direction is ultimately to, to pursue and purchase this, um, I, I don't want everyone to think that we are immediately going to have a carousel up and running in Capitola. It would be, I think, buying it to have that option at some point in the future if there was either a private operator or there was a fundraising drive to restore it. Um, some of those things. I think, I, I guess I guess I just want to make sure that everybody's clear about the expectations that, that getting it may be the smallest part of the challenge. Um, getting it operational and running is probably a much larger challenge. So with that, I will stop interrupting. Okay, thank you for, for that information. Um, where would we get the money from to purchase this? At we just went over the budget, mid-year budget, right? Well, that, and that, we were a bit that, short. That's, that's a good question. We haven't, we haven't looked at it because we didn't, weren't sure if that was the direction um, uh, the council wanted to go. Um, I'm not sure where, we're, where we'd find the funding for it at this point. Um, we can talk to the museum. We could talk to, um, to see if we're looking to fundraise for this at this point. But um, one of the reasons is, is because they're on a, a short time frame at that location. Yeah. It basically, uh -huh. what, what they've told is, is that he will part it, basically. Mm -hmm. He will sell it because he thinks the parts are worth more than the motor and all the other things and the horses individually. Um, so this is kind of a, a relatively short-term offer. Do you know how short-term? Um, by the time escrow closes. Do so you know? Six months is there. Their six months. Yeah. That that's the outside. Okay. And oh. sorry. Um, and is the 15, It's fifteen thousand approximately. Is it negotiable? 
I believe it is. Everything's negotiable. Mm -hmm. Everything's negotiable. So what would we would be approving today is up to fifteen thousand. My recommendation wouldn't be to Approve publicly it. establish a limit for the negotiation. Um, or, or, a floor. <laughs> or a floor. Or a floor. floor or a ceiling. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. Yeah. Well, my understanding <laughs> is we're only we would only be approving you to begin negotiations for a purchase agreement right and then it would have to come back to us before you actually sign it and go great we're buying this okay. so you're essentially just negotiating a contract to bring to us yeah i mean I, I, that's kind of to avoid this issue of sort of publicly disco disclosing our negotiation position fair enough Question. Rather, yeah rather than you just writing a blank check mm -hmm. i see you sam uh jacques had, had uh raised his hand first so to speak and then we'll come back to you council member Bertrand. um so our storage area is this a pretty secure we don't have to pay a lot of rent something we i have very dependable yes uh, we believe that's the case I, I could think of a place to put it in right now but not to mention it so definitely like the idea so um is is there anyone that the owner has been able to identify you you brought in an expert you know someone that does this you know that offers expertise that we could start working with I'm sorry. Uh, well, I mean, we have to get this thing up and running, not do, just. Oh, do it. I have any carrots? I yeah, yeah. Um, we w the initial we I talked with someone who does the restoration of the actual horses. Um, he was going to be looking into someone that could do that, but we do. I don't have anybody at this time. Okay. Um, but yes, we'd absolutely have to work with someone. If that was the if that was the direction, there are people who do it, like the, the the carousel in San Francisco that's oh. in the Golden Gate Park. There's a carousel on Pier 40, uh, 39 or 49, whatever it is. Right. All those had it. And I knew people who did the restoration. So there's people that do even that. even closer to that at at the boardwalk. Oh, there, there yeah, are people for sure. Okay, there you go. Council member story. Oh, thank you, um, Larry. You said you were pretty well sure that this is the actual carousel that was in Capitola. The, that is that, so just so you, the, the person we brought out the original time was the son of the person who made these and he had been putting these things together since he was 14 years old <laughs> he was able to document that it came from basically the time period and it was the size um, we have a kind of a chain of where it went and it follows that it went to some the, the person who was running it in Capitola took it to Oregon we've confirmed that they sold it to Casa de Fruta, and we've confirmed that Casa de Fruta sold it to the Red Barn. So, so uh, is it is it is it a hundred percent? No, it isn't a hundred percent because there's no there's no serial numbers or anything on it. So, okay, but there, there's documentation about this, uh, the provenance that would indicate that this was the actual. It, it, at this point, it is, it is verbal. We don't have any paperwork. There's no document. There's no paperwork. Okay, so it's a story. Yes, um, <laughs> and it was just saying we've checked. We've checked multiple. I mean, we've gone two different directions on it to look, but you're you're absolutely right. It is not. There is no paper provenance for this. Okay, uh, in the staff report, it approves. It, it makes a reference to a trustee. Yeah, that's, that's is, is that who's business and re receivership or there, there's some or? there's there's legal issues with that with the business uh -huh. with the, with the entire business, um, and I I don't know the details of it, but that's why. The, the 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 trustee is running this and that's why it would have to any any anything the city manager negotiates with the uh um with them would have to go to their um whoever is in charge of their finance piece of the mm. the, the trusteeship okay thank you mm -hmm. further questions no? okay with that we'll bring this item to public comment is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item Good. Hello. Well, I'm probably the only person in the room who actually remembers the carousel. <laughs> we brought it up at the BIA meeting the other day, and everybody was like, "Carousel? <laughs> <laughs> what carrot? Where? What? What? What are you talking about?" So, you know, I think that. I know one of the former council members was always pushing, Dennis was always really pushing for bringing back the carousel. I don't know that there's really a huge public outcry because I think the public for the most part doesn't have a recollection of it. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, where are you going to put it? 
not not even where you're going to put it where it's going to be secure from vandalism etc cetera, etc cetera, but where are you going to put it but somebody at the meeting had a perfect idea i thought it was really brilliant so how about the new mall huh. and let them fix it <laughs> maybe we can find the money to buy it and then give it to them and make them find a place for it because it could be secure there we're talking about wanting to have a family friendly place and activities problem solved it ties the village and the mall together a little bit brings in a little bit of a historical you know the real capitola to the mall um so you know i think it makes i i don't know i mean honestly where are you going to put it and I think that changes how you're going to raise the money, too. If you can say, oh, well, let's put it at uh, Jade Street, you know. Um, someplace where it's really, you know, is accessible to the public, which would be the mall or the village. And the village is kind of tight right now. I don't know that, you know, I don't know I'm, where are you going to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Uh-oh. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi, hi, I'm Glenn Hanna. I happen to be Karen's husband. Uh, I would say that before we do anything, we find out what it's, I think Karen has a great idea. If you can get the mall to run it and bear the costs, that, that's terrific. But for $15,000, I don't know how many triple, uh, trash cans we can buy. But I know if we spend $15,000 on triple trash cans, we'd have a place to use them. I have no idea what you're gonna do with a $15,000 carousel. Furthermore, that's the first drop in the bucket. You're gonna to have to move this thing. You're gonna to have to pay somebody to operate it. He's either gonna be a city employee or not. I mean, this could literally cost $100,000 a year easily you're shaking your head why wouldn't it cost a hundred thousand dollars if it's owned by the city you think the community's going to spend a hundred thousand dollars the red barn had it they've had it since 2014 it hasn't spun one revolution this is crazy if the mall wants it I would, the best I would offer would be to go to the mall and say, hey, if you want a carousel, which we think is a great idea, you can buy it for $15,000. And if they think that they can do it, that's a terrific idea. But for us to waste our time and money on a bygone dream is, in my view, nuts. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Saying none, we will bring it back to the council for comment. Uh, I would, I have a question first and foremost. Um, is it possible to, for us to direct you to negotiate for the price of the carousel and potentially for pieces of it? If we don't get or can't find a, a reasonable use for the whole carousel, I could still see the use for some aluminum horses and some of those benches because I know it had like two of the back-to-back -back benches you see on. Yeah, the benches are in not good okay, shape. Okay, forget the benches. Yeah. <laughs> but the horses I could see as art pieces in town even if we can't determine that the whole carousel is worth it. I am, for one, really stoked on the idea of the whole carousel and I think the mall would be a great place for it. Um, but. Are there, is there any way for any kind of council action that would say, yes, please negotiate a purchase agreement and contingency for not the whole thing? Anything, anything like that? I'm giving you half a thought and asking you to give me the other, I, the other I, half of it. I know, I'm sorry. I, I would think it would be depending on what they're wanting to do. I mean, I think the idea of for they have a lot of stuff to, to, to dispose of out there. Yeah. And I think the, the ease of getting it all taken care of when one is probably a, a time is valuable to them. But if it, the money piece is also a big thing. 
So I don't know if they'd be willing to, if, if they find someone that wants the whole thing, uh, other than the, you know, other, other than say us. they may go that direction. But I would think that um, any of it is, any of the stuff out there is negotiable. Because you mentioned they were also talking about parting it out. Yeah, correct, okay. correct. And I don't, when he said, I, I, yes, that, that was where they got some of the numbers that, that they're looking at, is that they think they can get more by doing it that way, but it takes a lot more time. Okay. So we could certainly make an offer. We can try to acquire the whole thing. We could make an offer on just the horses. <clears throat> My assumption would be that they would try to sell the whole thing intact, and then it would only be if they didn't find a buyer for that, then would they turn back and look at our offer for the horses or half of the horses, something along those lines. <clears throat> I, I will note that, that we have spoken with them all. Um, we did bring this up with them, and they, um, they're interested in it, but they're not ready to move at this stage. You know, they weren't ready to go out and spend 15000 to get it because they weren't clear about how it would fit with their plans in the future or not. Yeah. They think, I think it's possible in the future it could be a, a home for it. I think it's a pretty logical one, um, given that they have the space and obviously the clientele to run it. But at this point, we did discuss it with them, and they weren't prepared to leap at this time. If you negotiated a purchase agreement, would you come back to us with the price and where the money would come from before it was signed and done? Yes. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, so I so move then to have staff come back. What? What did you? What was the exact terms? Uh, enter a With the purchase agreement. A purchase agreement, and then come back to council on where you would get the funds from. I'm in agreement that there's no way we can operate a functioning carousel at fifty to hundred thousand dollars based off of the staff report. But it would be nice to be able to house some of those and then possibly see them go up in our community. Um, but before we even get there, we have to really see how much this is going to cost us. Um, so that would be my motion. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Council Member Story, did you have something yeah. to say? Um, well, one, I mean, it's fairly difficult to buy capital equipment when you have no idea what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. And you, I can't even, I mean, aside from the mall, which would be a good idea, but they may or may not uh, accept it. Um, so it, it hurts. it's hard for me to make that kind of approval and that kind of ex expenditure, unless maybe you could use the horses as trash receptacles. And then that would meet the Arts Commission's kind of guidelines for um, But, um, well, kidding aside, um, I, th I think, one, I wanted to ask, if we store it, where will it be stored? In the yard? In we, we have a location we think is correct, but we're not quite sure. We, I don't want to say where it is right now, but, you know, but we do have a pretty, well, I, I mean, if. if so, some of the city spaces are occasionally subject to break and break and entry, and we really don't want to sort of talk too much about but we, we believe we have a cool we believe antique. we have a secure location. It, it's yeah. in, well, I'm just gonna. It's an indoor location, which yeah. will be out of the way. It won't. And we're it, not paying public for works. Won't be tripping over it every other day. Um, it, it's a safe place that would it would okay. be indoors for sure. Okay. okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I I think instead of passing a motion to authorize staff to negotiate, I think you should just you know, tell the uh, trustee that we're here ready to receive their piece of, of, of white elephant equipment sure. that they can't get rid of. Uh, and we'll take it off their hands if they're so willing and leave it at that um, and seeing, if, you know, what they may do. That so. could be part of the negotiation, right? Well, yeah, that's what I'm hoping. Start the start negotiation that. there. Well. <laughs> no? All right, I try. But if you got a motion, I just... I don't think you're going to get there with, with this kind of motion. I mean, that's just. So. You're not going to get there with that kind of motion when you say enter into a discussion on, on a purchase. I mean, when you start a discussion on cost, that's what I heard earlier that you guys were going to. There's nothing that says it's going to be X well, amount. I, yeah, but I heard the motion was a reference on a purchase agreement. And so I just, I mean, um, I think that starts agreement. us off in a bad negotiating posture. I think you should, we could just direct the staff to see what they could do to acquire the carousel. 
How about change the and word? Leave it at that. Is it's that wording necessary to, for? Fine. Yeah. So my motion can stand, and you, you can take what Council Member Story is suggesting. Okay. okay. Friendly amendment. Are you asking for a friendly amendment? I think staff has agreed on. Yes. Yeah. To that. There's there's no magic in that language. Yeah. Okay. Comments? No. I'll just change the word to acquisition. Whichever way you want to do it. All right. There's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Almost there. Item 8E, introduce an ordinance amending chapter 17.80, signs. <laughs> That's an old sign. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Council. Uh, before you this evening is an amendment to our sign ordinance. This is based on the recent um, Supreme Court decision on Reed versus Town of Gilbert, which found that sign restrictions that are not content neutral violate the First Amendment. The decision also set forth a rigid test for assessing content, content neutrality and mandated that strict scrutiny uh, judicial review applies to laws that target speech based on communicative intent. So um, our city attorney has reviewed our sign ordinance and in the review had recommended several changes to the to signs. Um, the highlights are to first adding language allowing non-commercial content wherever commercial content is allowed. Second is adding definitions for commercial messages, commercial signs, and election period. Third is adding a section allowing a small temporary non-commercial signs on residential properties. And fourth is adding message neutrality, message subst substitution, prohibited sign content, and other government installed signs, and signs in the coastal zone sections. Sorry about that. Um, so those are the four major changes within the code. The last one, when we talk about signs in the coastal zone, this also incorporates um, the recommendations from the Coastal Commission when they reviewed our new sign ordinance. Mm -hmm. So this would move forward with the package for the LCP update with the ADUs so that we could have the same sign ordinance applicable throughout the city, which would be very nice for businesses. So staff recommends city council approve the first reading and waive reading of the text of the proposed ordinance amending title 17 to align with the recent legal decisions regarding non-commercial signs. Any questions? Any questions for staff? Council member story. Um, yeah, thank you. I guess my question is um, the sections um, 1780030C says that non-commercial signs will be allowed anywhere where commercial signs are permitted. Um, and I, I guess I'm thinking of um, sometimes when I'm driving around town, I, I see a sign um, in the middle of Bay Avenue on the meet on the island saying um, that there's church services down on the Esplanade. Is that a permitted location because we allow it? Or is it non-permitted because it's actually not permittable? If it's not permittable. It's so um, we wouldn't be grandfathering in those kinds of signage. No, the, the signs would be subject to the same standards and allowances of the sign code. So if it was a a sign that didn't comply and was never permitted, it would not be a legal non-conforming sign. We could still follow up and... Does that make it more incumbent upon us with this change to enforce our sign permits? Um, I, so basically with our sign permits, we typically are... We, 
we do follow up based on code enforcement complaints if we ever get a complaint. Um, so if there were a, a sign that wasn't com related to, was a non-commercial sign in which we received that complaint, we would do a follow up and the first step is to make sure it was a sign that was permitted. Mm -hmm. I see that sign there a lot. So that's just why mm -hmm. I bring that up. Um, and um, mostly on Sundays, so, but I just, I mean, yeah. you know, and I don't think anybody really minds. I mean, I, I happen to notice it more because I'm attuned to the, these sorts of things. And so, but I wonder if this kind of ordinance or this kind of legislation makes it maybe more incumbent upon us to, um, you know, really restrict non-permittable signs. I don't necessarily think that it does. I think it's sort of the opposite. It gives um, more grounds for complaints. Mm -hmm. So given that our code is comp enforcement is complaint driven, which is pretty common, mm -hmm. it um, widens the bases for possible complaints. So in theory, that could increase the amount of enforcement that we do. But I don't think that the, it, it's new case law and it certainly doesn't, imply, it doesn't impose additional restrictions on communities to change their enforcement mechanism. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and, and then also um, referring to that section, non-commercials allowed anywhere where commercial signs are permitted. But there's some, there's certain kind of signs um, and in certain locations that don't require a permit. So would these kind of non-commercial messages just be automatically um, approved if they fell into one of those categories? Hmm. My, well, I'm just gonna take a minute to look at the non, the, the signs that do not require permits. Because I believe those are typically like government signs so, uh, yeah, so 1780.050 is the signs allowed without permits, and they're very specific, on-site yeah, directional no. signs. Um, well, I think real estate's in there. Right? There, We added one within there. We, we fixed one, so we fixed one that was out of compliance number five, one bulletin board on a parcel occupied by a non-commercial and before it said place of public assembly organization and took out the place of public assembly. Um, so non-commercial organization with a maximum area of 12 square feet. We also modified, we added number seven, constitutionally protected non-commercial message signs, not to exceed three feet in height with a maximum of six feet per unit and six feet per non-residential property. Um, yeah, um, but I was kind of, uh, when I was reading through that list, tripping over murals on the exterior of a building that do not advertise a product, business, or service. So somebody could put up a non-commercial message mural and that's it. It's whatever mm -hmm. they want to say. Um, okay. There is uh, a new section in 060. It's the next page of prohibited yeah. signs and it I talks know. about um, obscene and indecent text and graphics, certain signs that are now prohibited. So I, I think the things that we would definitely would not want to see, we could, pr we are protected under this mm -hmm. section. Um, text or graphics that advertise unlawful activity and the list goes on, but that, that was placed there to, even within the, con the context neutrality to ensure that we don't have signs that we wouldn't want to have. Yeah, no, that could yeah, be no I, I understood the goal. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, one other question I noticed that there was in a couple of places there was reference to signs advertising local nonprofit, civic, or fraternal organizations, and that was marked out. What's, what, why was that excluded? And, and I'm kind of thinking about the banner over Monterey Avenue. And I, I believe it was because it was too specific. Um, because you're regulating a sign by content, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for specific to local nonprofits, civic and fraternal organizations. So. Yeah, it's a 
you're allowing this to be seen without a permit. You're allowing those signs to, to be posted without a permit, but requiring a permit for other similar signs that don't have, that have different content. Okay. So, and what's the impact of that on like the banner that goes over Monterey? A lot of organizations advertise there. So, so we put a lot of thought into that one, actually. Oh, you did? Because, oh, good. Yeah, because <laughs> it's still installed by the government agency. We, ha we have control over what goes on the banner. Um, but we took out the requirements of for local nonprofit, civic, and fraternal, because that's too narrow. And so we have a banner policy mm -hmm. that talks about what kind of banners are eligible for us to hang mm -hmm. over the street and it, it you know it limits it to these types of things or <clears throat> or or to notifications that are uh, intended for a community purpose and not intended for a commercial purpose so in other words free parking this weekend um isn't that content driven well, our view, I think, is is that we are hanging, we have certain policy about who and how we allow people to, who we allow to hang a sign, or, or sorry, whose banners we will hang over our street, rather than the content that people display on their own signs on their own property. But if uh, a private citizen came to us and said, I want a banner, I want to be on the banner over Monterey, and I wanted to say, happy birthday, George. So our, pos our position at this point would be that our banner policy would, the happy birthday, George message isn't an eligible thing for us to hang uh, using our, over our city street, from our city poles, with our city crews. Um, whether that held up, I don't know, but that would be the position we would take right now. So it's not in this ordinance, this ordinance has been the target, I think, of some sort of preemptive lawsuits. We've seen that in a number of other cities in this region. Um, so this language is coming out. Our existing policy would remain, and that governs whose banners we're willing to hang, not so much the language on it, but the purpose behind the banner. That's really what we're focused on, is what's the purpose of the banner? It has to be to inform the community of something that's happening in town, not about a private interest. I don't See, it's hard to talk about this without <laughs> talking about content it is it's magic. really hard right. and yeah. I, I you know <laughs> I, th I mean I think honestly that banner policy get people try to test it um, this may be another area where we'll see some litigation <laughs> in the next few years because maybe not hopefully not in Capitola over, banner. over that yeah. banner <laughs> but um, it, most agencies are or already have updating are, are updating or have updated their sign codes in response to the Gilbert case Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. So on the table 17.8-10, temporary sign standards. So I was trying to read this in terms of um, realty signs, you know, house for sale down the block, that kind of thing. Does that, um, does this table apply for that? You're talking about for sale, lease, and rent. Mm -hmm. But it says one per property, and so that's, the issue there. I mean, often a realty firm will put one at a corner and one halfway down the block or something of that sort. So um, when I first arrived in Capitola, I did hear a lot of history on this standard and the fact that this was, it's unique to Capitola. There's only, when there's an open house or a model home, there's one sign allowed on the property and one other uh, property with the owner's consent. So we really limit it, limit the amount of like open house signs because I think it was a problem in the past. So that that is the limitation that's been placed within the code, mm. and it's not a new change. Not a new change. That's just carryover. So I think the realty companies will still put them up, <laughs> but if there's a complaint, you might hear about it. We do get complaints. You do, and get we complaints. do follow up on those. And you do follow up. Um, Another one that's sort of like this, but it's more on a individual homeowner or apartment owner, apartment resident, is um, garage sales. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone does garage sales, and putting up signs uh, to, you know, tell everyone about it. I don't see anything in here, except for the special event. So would that cover that? It would. Just okay. Yeah. 
Okay, just want to make sure that people would still advertise their garage sales, especially coming up spring, right? There's going to be a lot of garage sales. Yes. And there's a city garage sale coming up, so that's nice news. Okay, that's my only question. Any questions? I just have uh, two quick questions. I'll be brief. Um, one, the, um, the new information about what an election period entails in terms of political signs. Hmm. Um, it says political signs can only be um, up during an election period, which it looks like it's added now means 90 days within an election. What was it before? So Was it just any time anyone's campaigning for anything? This is um, in reference to, I believe, another state regulation that's out there, the uh, election period. So, um, sorry. No, no worries. I'm just, I don't remember if that was the case four years ago, but seeing as how I'm up for re-election, I should probably know this. So, so this is something when we updated the, um, can you reference the section? So yeah, I I'm sorry. Questions. It's on packet page 156. It's uh, section 17.80.0. Oh, that's the definition. Well, the definition uh, I on packet page 156 is election period, the period beginning 90 days before any national, state, or local election in which city electors may, be, may vote up through the date of the election. And then it's um, a little bit further down when it actually talks about it was under the uh, allowed signs. Oh, um, yeah, packet page 159. And then it says political signs during an election period, which had just been um, right. It defined. just wasn't defined before, so we just added in a definition. Hmm. So it could have been that if someone who was getting elected in November started campaigning in July, they could put their signs up in July. Exactly. But now you can't until September. Exactly. Okay, I can handle that. Um, okay, other question. Um, I. And forgive me, but I'm, I'm just, I can't help myself out of curiosity. For what reason did we realize that we needed to prohibit signs that emitted odors, gases, or fluids? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying we should take that out. I just can't help but wonder why, why we have to tell people that. Can you reference the section? Yeah, sorry. Packet page 159, uh, prohibited signs, uh, section 17.80.060, number four, signs emitting odors, gases, or fluids. That was from the old code, and I think that was the previous law firm required us to put that in. Yes. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. Um, I got nothing else. Any other questions? Can I? I yes. On the election period, um, so you, you guys just recommended in the 90 days. Could we make it 120 days? Or is that? I, I don't actually know. My, I, my, I, I don't actually know. My bet is there's a reason it's 90. I can see if I can check. I'm closed out of my system right now, but I can see if I can check right now. I, I believe, Sam, it's a PPC. There's a certain amount, if I recall when I ran the campaigns before it's, it's that's my guess required. my guess is there's a reason it's not yeah. I do know that in conversations with our um, city clerk when we were updating the zoning code um, she had concerns that the, our regulations in our sign code didn't match the regulations for the elections mm -hmm. so I'm, I think this is compliant with the election regulation and that's for anyone's yard or anything like that mm -hmm. but the FPBs I, I know they um, they dictate when we can put up signs? Yeah. I think we're both looking at the FPPC website now. Mm. And I think the FPPC defines the period as 90 days. Mm. Election cycle. So just out of curiosity, if someone's being voted on in the primary election and then again in the general election, does that mean you have to take their sign down <laughs> and then put it back up within 90 days of the general? Likely. Wow. That's a good one. Okay. Well, no, we can I can live with that. Yeah. Some of these signs are almost permanent. Yeah. 90 days. 
put it in the back seat of my car and drive around with it. That, that. Uh -huh. No, you can't put signs on cars. <sighs> okay, bumper stickers. Okay, we um, are we waiting for further clarification? Sam, were you requesting further clarification on the if we can make it 120 days? There's a 90 day, wow. the FPPC defines a 90 day election cycle. So my guess is that codes are modeling after that. Um, I'll leave it up to the will of the council. It seems to me, um, I know uh, my experience in being involved with local politics, a lot of times I see signs going up during the summer. Yeah, um, it does seem like a short. Before and um, and I think that we should encourage that as much as we can. And so if it's, I would just request that whatever motion is approved here, and I'll move the staff recommendation, um, but that if we can possibly make that 120 days, that we direct staff to do that. But if they find that it, it's already preemptive and we can't, then they leave it at 90 days leave it at that but that would just be I think we change. just found it I would ah shoot I thought if I talked long enough <laughs> I know <laughs> that usually works is it legally 90 days I think so wait but is it legally 90 days that signs are allowed or is that just what the legal definition of an election period is because in that case we could change the wording to say that signs are allowed within 120 days and not signs are allowed within an election period but on, and that would be a solution. But on the political signs, it says during the uh, during the election period. That's what I'm saying. Is is if if the FPPC rules are just. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So in other words, they're only allowed during the election. I yeah, period. I guess that was my question: is are they only allowed during the election period because that's FPPC rules, or is right. that just what we're saying? In which case, we could just stop using the phrase election period. <laughs> I mean, from, from their standpoint, it must be recording requirements. You know, when you get donations, how you maybe you know, all that sort of stuff. Well, I seem to remember signs going up in summer though, like like yeah. council member stories. Well, I would, yeah. I would maybe. Uh, I would make the motion in the alternative, and then staff still has Just the ability offline to signs. verify the final Sorry. results. And okay, I'll second that. Thank you, Sean. Yes, it, it, it was a well thought out motion, and I, I have to agree to it. I can't, I can't resist. <laughs> and it's getting late. So we're so. gonna, we're gonna vote. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have a motion in a second. So I don't think we heard the motion. We can't. <laughs> no kidding. We. Um, <laughs> we're trying to find this 90 days thing there's there's a statute that defines a temporary political sign as a sign that um, is placed no sooner than 90 days prior to the scheduled election there's some kind of wrinkles in the statute if you want us to look at this and see if we can extend it we can bring it back but we we can't do it from here yeah that and the motion was to approve staff recommendation but direct staff to look at whether we can make that election period where signs are allowed 120 days before the election. Okay, we'll but if you find sure. that it's not possible, you have the discretion to keep it at 90. For the second reading? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Well, I guess it'd be August, not mm -hmm. September, is when signs no. would be allowed. If, if we're going to change it to 120 days, we'll need to do the first reading again. Oh. Sorry, it's not a clerical. That's not, <laughs> officer no fun. Well, even though, <laughs> but we made the motion in the alternative so that <laughs> it could be I, more. I can't think of a way that you could do it and, and proceed with the first reading. So you could proceed with the first reading tonight at 90 days. And I could correct it. And you could, if we come back, you could tell us, either come back with a second reading at 90 days, or if you can extend it to 120, come back with a first reading at 120. Come back with the first, uh, yeah, it sounds like the same difference. So. It'd be a second reading. Let's keep it at the 120. 
<laughs> it, if, if the first reading tonight with 90 days, if they come back to us with 90 days again, it would be a second reading. But if they come back, if they find out we can extend it to 120, it I would be it. a first reading. Okay. But well, if we say 120 now, that we can't the say issue. 120 right now. Why we not? have to. They have to do the research to see if that's legal or allowable or yes, that's permissible. what we just said. What? Yes. That's what we've been saying. That's what we've been saying, that we need to look at whether we can extend it to 120 days. We aren't, we aren't going to be able, I mean, we could take a 30 minute break and do that, but no. I don't know that that's the will of the council. <laughs> I think we heard a motion uh, from, from council member Story, if well, I'm not what, mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I, is there a particular time urgency about whether we do another first reading or a second reading or? It's just, it's only a second reading if it comes back at 90 days. It's a first right. reading if it's changed to 120 because we hadn't read anything saying it would be 120. Are you? The only urgency well, around urgency? this is just that, that we've anything? seen, there has been lawsuits, people challenging local jurisdiction says that we want to correct it. I don't know that two weeks matters. And, and we could just enforce consistent with the law regardless of what our ordinance yeah. says. Okay. Could the modification be to take out during an election period? So political signs, I, I, I located, really, yeah, we just I mean, the, yeah. these are constitutional issues that we're dealing with, so I'm just really reluctant to give an opinion from the dais on it. Okay. Yeah, no, and that's, that's understandable. I, I think that we should just, one, take the time, leave it in, in the alternative, and come back to us with another first read, okay? W w what you may find. Okay. So where? I think there was a motion on the table to approve the first reading and waive, and then if there's any changes, right? There was a second from. Second. Yeah. yeah. So if we if it's against federal law, I mean it's a federal guideline. If we're wrong, I'm sure we'll come back and and amend it. So, okay. So. So the motion, so the, there's one motion to um, proceed with the first reading with the ordinance as written, which is 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, does that motion include a request that staff look to see if we can extend to 120 days, and if so, bring it back with, for another first reading? Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Right. Okay, and then it sounds like, did Council Member Story make a motion to continue? That was, that was, his, that motion. was his motion. Oh, that was your motion. Okay, okay. And was there a second? Jock second. Jock second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Last but not least. Good evening, Mayor Peterson, Council Members. Uh, we're here tonight to approve the Bro Bromer Street Complete Street Improvement Project for, to bid for construction. This slide shows the limits of the project from 41st Avenue West to the city limits with the intersection with the county boundary. Bids for the project will be broken into two sections. The base bid will be addressing uh, the, greatest, the area of greatest need in green and option B will, include, will be included depending on pricing that's outlined in yellow. The original scope of work included both A and the base, uh, base bid and section B. However, we have made B optional due to the expected pricing and because that section of the road is in much better condition and has sidewalks on both sides. The section outlined in red was previously completed as another project and all the curb ramps and roadway was improved at that time. Looking at the schedule cost and funding, with your approval tonight, we will advertise bids for April 1st and begin construction this summer. Funding comes through the RTC3, RSTPX exchange funding, and Measure D. This slide shows a, oh wow, it's hard to see. This slide shows a cross section of the project with new pavement down the middle of the roadway, new sidewalks on both sides, uh, resulting in sidewalks on both sides with new sidewalks going in on the north side of the street, new bike lanes on the north side of the street, and uh, parking will only be found on the south side of the street when the project is completed. 
Here we wanted to highlight two unique features of the project, the first being an updated median that was designed to accommodate uh, large vehicle traffic coming off of 41st and also preventing traffic cutting across, uh, westbound traffic cutting across towards the um, hotel creating dangerous roadway conditions. The second unique feature is the green bike box, which is a, a, which allows cyclists to filter to the front of the roadway and improves their safety as they travel through the intersection. This, this feature was added after our coordination with the Bicycle Coalition. We did want to highlight some of the collaboration we went through on this project with the community, the residents, and Fairfield Inn who provided space for the workshop on March 26th. And a lot of the features from, uh, that we were able to incorporate from, these, uh, in, from this input was something that we just appreciate the ability to interact with the public on that. At this stage, I'm ready to happy, happy to answer any questions or move forward with the stack or staff recommendation to approve the project to put out to bid for April 1st. Thank you. Any questions? I'll just have one. Yes, Vice Mayor Brooks. Is this a project from the 1819 or 1920 CAP projects? So this has been on the books for longer than that, but I, this is 1819, I believe, and then we're bidding it now. So we, it took a little bit longer to get completion of the design and everything. Okay, and then just as I recall, I believe that was the intent of council's direction previously was to complete 1819 projects first as our, what was it called, our um, our priorities at the base or beginning of the year, is that correct? That's That sounds correct, yeah. Okay, so we've we budgeted for this. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. Mm -hmm. So the original grant to the RTC, did that ex include the, the stub extension? So we included that in the original scope of the project just because it made sense to not leave a tail end of the, you know, the street the last 200 feet out of the project. Um, over the time that we've been working on the project, you know, our cost estimate has gone up, um, but our funding didn't go up, so we decided to put that as an option, and depending on pricing, we will or will not include it in the project. Okay. Councilmember Story. Um, on the optional section, um, we seem to be short 76400 to do that. Any ideas or where we may come up with? So, so our intent is to, in all likelihood, that we wouldn't end up doing that section, and we would just address the area of greatest need. If you looked at the, the pavement condition on the section of Bromer in the, the let's see, the the green area is in much worse condition than the yellow, and we don't believe that we, I think we're addressing the area of greatest need by doing that. Okay, so there is no option. Well, there well, is, you know, potentially the bids that come in would come in under, and we could incorporate the entire project area. And so we don't know at this stage whether or not we would have a shortfall, and, and I think in all likelihood, our estimate is that it will be a little bit higher and that we will just include only the base bid section of the project. Once you did the bids and it came back to us, if we were close, then we can maybe look at funding that entire project since we're out there. So, so the way we do this now, once council gives the authority, if the bids come in under the bid amount, the public works director is authorized to proceed with the project. This is a little bit different because we do anticipate this funding shortfall the fall that we wouldn't be able to do option B. So I think the question would be, let's say, for example, the project came back and the total bid for everything was 5,000 more than we needed. I think in that case, we would be coming back to council and saying, you know, this looks like a good deal to get the full project done. Um, and we would propose a strategy to bring 5,000 more into it. If we came back at the 76,000, 70, Seventy-six four. The seventy-six thousand dollar deficit. I think we would just proceed with the base bid, unless we got direction this evening, and just do the base project. But council can give other direction this evening. Okay. No. Thank you. Question. Question. No. Okay. Uh, now is the time for any member of the public to address the council on this item. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. 
comments? I do have a comment. I, you know, I've had a lot of feedback from various bicycle riders, and I think they've come here uh, many times. And fixing this street would be great. It's, it's. I mean, I've I've been to the public meetings. I, I think that uh, Steve and, and you have met with them, and you've satisfied all their issues with driveway and all that sort of stuff, which is pretty good. I, I appreciate the uh, the department working with the residents on this, and also responding to the bike needs. I'm, I'm more in favor of just the plan to extend if we are under bid, but go to 38th, uh, 48th, uh, excuse me, 41st to 38th. That's my, my section. Because the other section is fine from my standpoint. Comments, discussion? I would just concur with Council Member um, Bertrand. I, I would make um, a motion that we uh, move forward with just the base bid, and if it comes under comes in under and we can afford through uh, the optional section sc schedule B then we should do so but otherwise just maintain at the base bid and the, the project that's included there yeah and that's how we have it structured currently great yeah, and I'll second that okay. council member story any comments no comments no okay uh, we have a motion and a second all in favor aye, aye. any opposed any abstentions motion carries unanimously and that concludes our meeting thank you to staff for hanging in there thank you Kingston our technician for hanging in there uh, thank you all at home for watching take care of yourselves and take care of each other our meeting is adjourned yeah.